Welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's October 5th, 2017 meeting. For everyone here, please note that today's meeting is being uh, live streamed on the ncpc.gov website. Uh, we do have a quorum, so without objection, we'll adopt the agenda as has been publicly noticed. Agenda item number one is the report of the chairman. Um, I'll note that last month we said goodbye to Deborah Young, who had been in federal service for 38 years, and this month, we introduced her last month, but uh, Deborah Dixon is the new director of administration, and so she is here, so welcome. Um, we look forward to working closely uh, with you. Uh, we also want to welcome Kevin Ortiz, who is attending uh, today as an alternate for uh, Congressman Trey Gowdy, who is chair of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Mr. Ortiz is a professional staff member. Uh, welcome. Agenda item number two is the report of the executive director, and we have Mr. Sox sitting in for Mr. Acosta. I have two items, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman. At last month's meeting, the commission reviewed and approved the final submission guidelines. The commission also approved the final National Environmental Policy Regulations Act regulations, except those sections addressing the issue of submission of a signed record of decision or finding of no significant impact. The commission directed the staff to work with the National Park Service and the General Services Administration to reach final resolution on language for the sections at issue. You delegated to the executive director the authority to approve the revised language agreed to by the parties and to submit the revised language to the Council on Environmental Quality for approval. NCPC staff work with the National Park Service, General Services Administration, and the Council on Environmental Quality to develop language to address the issue of a signed ROD or FONSI. The NEPA regulations were updated to include new language with the concurrence of the respective parties. The executive director approved the revised language and the NEPA regulations were submitted to the Council on Environmental Quality for approval. Having received CEQ's approval, the final regulations were posted in the Federal Register September 29th and will be in effect on October 30th. On a separate matter, I'm pleased to report that the agency's new website will be live on Friday tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Sox? <clears throat> so again, the, the new website will be live on Friday, meaning tomorrow. tomorrow yes. Perfect. Excellent. Agenda item number three is the legislative update, update and we have uh, General Counsel Ms. Schuyler. Um, things are perking, but I have nothing to report. Excellent. And agenda item number four is the consent calendar. We have four items. Uh, item 4A is the preliminary and final approval of exterior signage of the Renwick Gallery and that's submitted to us by the Smithsonian Institution. And I will say that NCPC and the Smithsonian, the National Park Service, and the District of Columbia have worked together very closely over the past year on signage at the Renwick Gallery, given its uh, proximity to the White House and uh, Lafayette Square. Um, and we want to acknowledge the work of all parties. And uh, Mr. Horvath uh, at the uh, Smithsonian has been especially helpful. Um, and also, if you haven't uh, been to the Renwick since they closed for a significant renovation located at the corner of 16th and Penn, I encourage you to go. It's quite nicely done. Uh, item number 4B is the preliminary and final approval of site and development plans for improvements to the BW Parkway uh, in Maryland to accommodate the new Purple Line light rail transit facility. And that is brought to us by the National Park Service on behalf of the Maryland Transit Authority. Agenda item 4C is to close a portion of a public alley in square 221 located at 15th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, and submitted by the District uh, Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. And last, agenda item 4D is to approve preliminary and final site and building plans for security and design upgrades at the Anacostia Community Museum, which is in Southeast Washington, and that is submitted to us by the National Park Service on behalf of the Smithsonian. And while Commissioner Dixon is not here, I can assure you he has <laughs> called and supported this agenda item. Um, are there any questions on the consent calendar, the four items? Hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the consent calendar say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's passed. The first item on the open session agenda is item 5A, and it's the approval of, re of revised preliminary and final emphasis on final, 
uh, site and building plans for the um, Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial. Um, earlier today, the commission um, did a field tour and went to see a mock-up of one of the panels. We went inside the Department of Education building and looked out so that we see both perspectives on transparency. Um, thank you to Julia Coster and staff for arranging that and for uh, Dan File and um, others at uh, Eisenhower Memorial uh, Commission. General, nice to see you. Um, Mr. Webb, so um, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Ms. Lee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service, on behalf of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, has submitted revised preliminary and final plans for the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial. Over the last 11 years, the Commission has been reviewing the Eisenhower Memorial Project. Beginning with approval of the site and design principles in 2006 through final approval for the memorial design in 2015. More recently, the Commission provided comments on a revised concept design in February 2017, and today we will review the revised preliminary and final plans. As you may recall, in February 2017, the Commission commented favorably on a revised concept for the memorial. At the time, the design team proposed three changes to the memorial design based on further consultation with the Eisenhower family. These changes shifted the memorial narrative. The changes included revising uh, the image on the tapestry from a Kansas landscape to an aerial view of the Normandy coast. You can see the tapestry highlighted in red in the slide. Relocating the young Eisenhower sculpture from the center of the memorial here to the LBJ promenade and removing four trees from the landscape design to open up views of the revised tapestry. In general, the commission provided two findings. The overall placement, scale, and assembly of the primary memorial elements had not significantly changed since the 2015 final approval, and the revised memorial design continued to satisfy the site selection design principles. The commission also provided specific comments, which I will walk you through momentarily. Here is the current site plan. Based on previous comments from the Commission and other stakeholders, the latest design includes the following changes. Revising the tapestry from a photograph of the Normandy coastline to a more abstract drawing of the Normandy cliffs. Relocating the Jon Eisenhower sculpture from the LBJ promenade here to the northwest corner of the site at the, uh, near the corner of Independence and Sixth Street and adding a new inscription wall near the sculpture here in this location, and also retaining the four trees that were previously removed from the proposed landscape plan. So moving on to staff analysis. First, I'll discuss the site selection design principles, and then I will focus on the design modifications that the applicant has made since the revised concept review, and how the applicant has responded to previous comments. These comments include proportion and transparency of the tapestry, the new location for the Jon Eisenhower sculpture, landscape, and lighting. Here you can see the seven design principles that were developed by NCPC during the site approval process in 2006 to guide the memorial design. The overall intent of the principles was to preserve views of the Capitol and Lord Maryland Avenue, create a memorial that functions as a gathering place and incorporates significant green space, reflect land plan principles and respect the architecture of the surroundings. Staff confirms that the revised preliminary and final plans continue to satisfy these principles. I want to emphasize that we will be only looking at a few project components that change this things revised concept. We will start with the tapestry. Here is an aerial view of the memorial with the Normandy landscape image on the tapestry that you saw in February. During revised concept, the Commission expressed concern ab about the proportion and transparency of this image. The Commission questioned the ability to recognize the Normandy coast due to the location of the horizon line, which you can see here in the lower portion of the tapestry, resulting in an image mostly composed of, of clouds. They noted that the coastline was located below the tree canopy of the site, as you can see here, and that the image appeared stretched and forced to fit the size of the tapestry. 
Therefore, the Commission recommended to further study the image proportion and composition in relationship to the size of the tapestry and consider raising the horizon line. The next couple of slides show a progression of the tapestry mock-up. The design team has developed three aesthetic mock-ups throughout the design process, including the one we saw today during the site visit. Here you can see pictures from the first mock-up which shows the Kansas landscape. This mock-up was installed at the memorial site in 2011. The picture on the left here uh, is a view looking from the memorial site to the LBJ building, and the picture on the right is a view from within the LBJ offices looking out to the National Air and Space Museum. As you can see, this mock-up was successful in terms of legibility and contrast. Last May, the applicant prepared a second tapestry mock-up, this time showing the Normandy landscape image. The mock-up was installed at the National Building Museum for the Commission of Fine Arts and also as part of the Section 106, 106 consultation process. CFA and the DC State Historic Preservation Officer expressed concerns with the legibility of the tapestry and the impacts on the LBJ building, as well as the other changes to the memorial design. As a result, the design team changed their direction and concluded that a more abstract approach to the Normandy landscape with higher contrast, similar to the Kansas landscape mock-up, would improve image clarity against the backdrop of the LBJ building. So here is the new approach for the tapestry image. As you can see, this image is an interpretive line drawing rather than a photo montage. The image continues to represent the Normandy coastline with point to hook at the center of the composition. CFA approved this design two weeks ago at their September 2017 meeting, commenting that the hand drawing conveys more emotional power than the previous Normandy photograph. They requested further review of the tapestry details as they develop. The applicant has addressed the commission's concern about proportion by centering the image within the tapestry, focusing on the landscape in the foreground, eliminating the sky. You can see that there are no clouds in the image, leaving blank spaces around the frame of the tapestry. You can see how the water here and the cliffs fade around the edges. In general, we find that the revised image fits the tapestry proportionally. The image at the bottom shows the, the structural grid of the tapestry. The grid is composed of approximately 600 panels. 20% of the panels, which is approximately 120 panels, have no line work other than the structural grid of the tapestry. Here is a view of the revised tapestry from the center of the memorial core. You can see that the design team added shading, as you can see here, on the vertical faces of the cliff. The image is now more transparent at the top and lower portion, and more opaque in the middle, which is around the cliff. The applicant has provided these density diagrams to help us understand the transparency of the tapestry. Compared to the previous Normandy image, the new approach shown at the bottom of the slide is more transparent overall and allows more light to pass through. The top and bottom sections of the revised tapestry, you can see here and here where the water and the sky, is now the most opaque area of the tapestry. Sorry, the top and bottom sections of the revised tapestry image have equal transparency levels while the middle section, which is here, is the most opaque area of the tapestry. Staff notes that the applicant has modified the tapestry image to address the commission's con comments regarding the level of transparency and overall proportion of the image. In February, the commission requested additional visual studies and a mock-up of the revised tapestry on site, addressing visual impacts to the LBJ building. Here are pictures from the mock-up we saw this morning. The image on the left is a view looking from the memorial site toward the LBJ building, and the image on the right is a view from the interior offices of the LBJ building looking out at Independence Avenue. The applicant is still exploring the density and contrast of the panels. As you can see in the pictures, the mock-ups that we saw today consisted of two panels, a denser panel, which is this one, and a lighter approach. The final result will strike a balance between these two approaches. Staff finds that the tapestry image preserves views to and from the LBJ building. 
Moving on to maintenance and durability, the revised art does not change the tapestry material, panel welds, or fabrication methods. If you recall, the applicant, in consultation with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Department of Defense, and Smithsonian, participated in a comprehensive analysis that supports the durability and maintenance of the tapestry. There are three basic reports that resulted from this effort. The first two documents were submitted during preliminary review in 2014, and the third document was submitted during final review in 2015. At the time, the commission found that the results of a durability test conducted by the applicant showed that the tapestry materials and panel welds were resistant to corrosion, and the proposed tapestry panel welds were mechanically sound. Tapestry cables are now arranged in a different pattern, but the structural grid of the tapestry remains the same. Since the tapestry material, welds, and fabrication have not changed, the durability standards, maintenance, and operational protocols remain consistent with previous test results. Moving on to the Jon Eisenhower sculpture. Last February, the Commission expressed concerns about removing the Jon Eisenhower sculpture from the center of the memorial to a less visible location at the LBJ promenade behind the tapestry. You can see here. Staff notes that the Jon Eisenhower sculpture has been relocated from the LBJ promenade to the memorial foreground as requested by the commission. The placement of the sculpture on the northwest corner of the site relates to the urban context and pedestrian circulation patterns. In addition, this location balances the eastern side of the memorial with the information building. As you may know, uh, as you may know there is an existing sculpture directly to the north across Independence Avenue and 6th Street, which is here in front of the National Air and Space Museum, which announces the entry to the museum. Regarding pedestrian circulation patterns, given that the Landfall Metro Station and 7th Street are located to the west of the site, we anticipate that the majority of the pedestrian traffic will come from the west as well as the north. You may recall the west side of the memorial is devoted to honoring Eisenhower's career as a military officer and includes the General Eisenhower element to the west of the memorial core as well as the General Eisenhower column in the northwest corner of the site. You can see the column here. The design team is proposing a new inscription wall, which is here, near the John Eisenhower sculpture. This wall includes a piece of the homecoming speech that Eisenhower gave upon his return to Abilene in 1945. So here is an enlarged plan of the Northwest Entry Plaza. You can see the elements of the plaza, the John Eisenhower sculpture, the inscription wall framing the southern edge of the plaza, the general Eisenhower freestanding column. You can also see a few benches and shade trees. Here is the revised Jon Eisenhower sculpture, which will be seated on a 30-inch high limestone podium. Here is the new inscription wall. The wall will be 6 feet tall by 15 feet long. Here you can see a rendering looking south at the plaza. The sculpture is seated on a low podium to provide a sense of human scale as visitors enter the site and walk around the podium. Staff finds that the placement of the Jon Eisenhower sculpture and inscription wall at the Northwest Entry Plaza complements the memorial thematic organization, relates to the surrounding context, and creates a sense of arrival. Regarding landscape, in February 2017, the design team proposed the removal of four trees adjacent to the memorial core to, to increase views to the tapestry. You can see those trees highlighted in red here, flanking the memorial core. The landscape design brings back those trees and revises the species of the central tree, which is highlighted in blue here, from a London plain to Bore Oak to give the central growth of trees a stronger character and presence and match the two adjacent trees, which are also oak. Staff supports the retention of the four trees because they strengthen the notion of a memorial within a park frame memorial, the Maryland Avenue view shed and provide shade. Lastly, we will discuss the revised lighting plan. In February, the commission requested a revised lighting plan consistent with the overall lighting design for the memorial that considered the relocated Jon Eisenhower sculpture. 
The lighting plan is the same as the previously approved design with the addition of lighting for the sculpture of Eisenhower as a young man at the inscription wall at the Northwest Entry Plaza. Here is a rendering of the Northwest Plaza. The applicant proposes to illuminate the sculpture of John Eisenhower with a single projector designed to focus on the statue, and the inscription wall will have linear up lighting at the base of the wall, similar to the memorial, the, the memorial core inscription walls. Here you can see an eye view of Maryland Avenue toward the Capitol. You can see how the tapestry will be lit from the bottom and fade at the top to respect the nighttime prominence of the Capitol building. Here is a closer view from the memorial standing at the, memorial, at the Maryland Avenue historic carpetway. Staff notes that the applicant has provided an updated lighting plan as requested by the commission. Lastly, I will provide an update regarding the Section 106 consultation process. Last February, the commission requested that the applicant conduct additional Section 106 consultation to ensure that the proposed design changes would not intensify adverse effects to historic properties. The DC State Historic Preservation Officer reviewed the latest mock-up two weeks ago and noted that while the tapestry would be visible in front of the LBJ building, a significant number of individual panels would be blank, allowing the elevation of the National Register of Historic Places listed building to remain fully, fully legible. Finally, I would like to note that we have received seven public comments for your consideration. Six of them have been attached to your EDR, and the latest comment that we received yesterday has been distributed to you. So with that, uh, the executive director's recommendation is for the commission to approve the revised preliminary and final site and building plans for the Eisenhower Memorial, confirm that the revised plans continue to satisfy the design principles, Note that the applicant has modified the tapestry image to address the commission's comments regarding transparency and proportion. Find that the tapestry image preserves views to and from the LBJ building. Find that the revised image does not alter the tapestry material, wells, or fabrication methods. Note that the Jonas and Howard sculpture has been relocated to the LBJ, from the LBJ promenade to the memorial foreground as requested by the commission support the retention of the trees, and note that the applicant has responded to a commission request by providing an updated lighting plan and conducting additional Section 106 consultation. With this, I conclude my presentation. I'm available for questions the commission may have, and the project team is here also to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee, very much. Uh, we have, uh, uh, representing the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, uh, Victoria Tigwell, um, who will open up the public comment period. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'd like to recognize one of our commissioners, um, Al Gadaldig from New York. He's one of our original presidential appointees, which means he's been on the commission for 17 years. And I think he's been at every one of these meetings. So we are grateful for his steadfastness. And he's again with us today. I just have two things um, I'd like to do. First, um, there is a letter from Susan Eisenhower in support of the project representing the Eisenhower family. And I know you have it in your packets, but for the benefit of everyone else here, I'd just like to read it. It's very brief. Chairman Bryant and NCPC commissioners, on behalf of the Eisenhower family, I want to express our support for these recent design modifications made to the tapestry image by the Gary team. The striking new image with its artistic rendering of the Normandy coastline in peacetime will serve as a meaningful memorial to Eisenhower's leadership and the sacrifices made by the Allied forces in the liberation of Europe. It will also be a reminder of the peace that was secured during his presidency. We hope with these recent modifications that the project will proceed to construction. Thank you all very much for your work in making this tribute a reality. Susan Eisenhower. And then also, um, we have had questions from time to time about how the Department of Education feels about its new neighbor. So um, we have sent a video over um, from the Secretary of Education that's a very short video as well for your viewing. Thank you. I'm pleased to welcome the Eisenhower Commission to the Department of Education. I regret not being with you today, 
but I wanted to offer this greeting and some thoughts on this important occasion. President Dwight D. Eisenhower is and will continue to be a towering figure in the American public conscience. His brilliant and courageous D-Day plan to take the beaches of Normandy led to the liberation of millions across Western Europe. As we face many challenges today, may his example steal our backbones. While the four-star general might be known as the liberator to many in Europe, we know President Eisenhower as the desegregator. Whether it's the armed forces or America's schools, there must be no second-class citizens in this country, he said. Eisenhower liberated people from Nazism abroad and liberated people from racism at home. His strength of character is a model for us all. That's why we are delighted to welcome the Dwight D. Eisenhower Presidential Memorial to our neighborhood. Many of us will only have to look out our windows to gain inspiration from what looks to be a gorgeous memorial. Thank you for this timely presentation and for your years of work with the department to ensure the memorial is worthy of such a man. So if I may, I'd like to leave you with this. Here at the Department of Education, we like Ike. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Tegwell. Uh, second on the agenda is uh, we, all, we have only one person signed up to speak, and that's Justin Shubo, representing the National Civic Arts Society. Uh, Mr. Shubo, are you here? Yep. Welcome back, you have five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished commissioners, my name is Justin Shubo. I speak on behalf of the National Civic Arts Society. As nearly everyone, including members of this commission, have long known, this is an entirely inappropriate memorial with which to commemorate President Eisenhower. Indeed, NCPC commissioners have previously said that the design looks like an incomplete highway overpass or something like the apocalyptic landscape at the end of the movie Planet of the Apes. As the New Yorker reported, the design has, quote, managed to achieve something rare in Washington. In true bipartisan spirit, almost everyone hates it, unquote. Not even Frank Gehry's friends seem to like the design, which has been described as an iron curtain to Ike. To quote from Paul Goldberger's official biography of Gehry, quote, Gary felt few people in the architecture community seemed willing to defend him. Gary did not consider the possibility that many of his peers were simply not enamored of the memorial design and that it was their architectural judgment, not any lack of loyalty, that was preventing them from speaking out. It did not occur to him that the architects he respected and who he knew respected him might have simply viewed this one as a miss, as one of those moments when Babe Ruth strikes out. It's not just, unquote, it's not just Gary's friends who haven't come to his defense. The tapestry mock-up we saw in person was scathingly reviewed in the press two weeks ago. The Weekly Standard began its article by quoting a certain Katrina Bridges, a federal employee who was on her lunch break outside the Department of Education building. Ms. Bridges looked at the mock-up and said, quote, it looks like tin foil balled up and woven through bubble wrap, unquote. I personally spoke with other employees observing the mock-up and all were baffled by it. One said it looked like mold. The mock-up brings to mind the story of the emperor's new clothes. There is no there there. From most vantage points, the scrim is barely visible against the backdrop of the Department of Education building. Up close, one can maybe figure out that the design remembers a doodle of something or other. It is illegible and hard to read. And if you can even figure out that the image is that of a cliff, you can't tell what cliff it is, nor at what time period we're talking about. The design will be a complete mystery to everyone. None of this is controversial, and we believe NCPC commissioners know it. At the last meeting at which this commission reviewed the proposal, Chairman Bryant said that if he were on the Commission of Fine Arts, he might very well not approve the design. The real question is whether NCPC commissioners will vote accordingly. We know that some commissioners have said in the past that it is not NCPC's role to weigh in on aesthetics and symbolism. However, part of this commission's responsibility is to enforce the Commemorative Works Act, 
which requires the commission to enforce aesthetic and symbolic standards. To quote the purpose of the act, quote, the purposes of this chapter are to preserve the integrity of the comprehensive design of the L'Enfant and Macmillan plans for the nation's capital, to ensure that future commemorative works are appropriately designed and reflect a consensus of the lasting national significance of the subjects involved. It is obvious that this postmodern, ugly, and gargantuan design does not preserve the integrity of the comprehensive design of the L'Enfant and Macmillan plans. It is likewise obvious that the design is not appropriately designed. And it is obvious that the design does not reflect a consensus of the lasting national significance of President Eisenhower. Indeed, the consensus is that the design fails at this fundamental task. Therefore, it is this commission's duty to vote against this design on aesthetic and symbolic grounds. It is high time that this insult to Eisenhower's memory be rejected once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shuba. That closes the public comment uh, period. Um, before we open it up to commission members, I'll note that, uh, and for others, that again, that which is before us are the revisions to the preliminary and final site and building plans. As such, it's just the four items that uh, Ms. Lee outlined that defines our scope of discussion. So the whole project is not before us. So that narrow scope of items would be the revisions to the tapestry image, the better proportioned, more transparent parts of it. Uh, the landscape plan, notably the trees, uh, the relocation of the young Eisenhower Memorial, and then the lighting plan that's been submitted as well. So those uh, items define our scope of discussion today. With that, uh, open it up to Mr. Shaw. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about the tapestry change. Um, so is the material expected to get a patina to it or sort of change over time? And if it is, how do you think that will sort of impact the new design, the scrum? Did things get darker or lighter? Um, and then also, I didn't see a picture of the scrum looking directly forward in the dark with the lighting plan. I saw it from a view. Like, is there a way for us? What does it look like if you're looking head on? with the light and the full, the full tapestry, if that makes sense. Do you know? About the finish, so I understand the mock-up that we saw today was for aesthetic purposes only, and it will go through a process where they will get, a, it's called passivation, where they will get like a chemical to protect it for corrosion, but I don't believe it will change the, the look uh, the design team is here if they want to add anything to the finish of the, mo the tapestry. That will be helpful. Just Is it going to turn green like all of our other statues or will it be like shimmering forever? So I'm Craig Webb from Geary Partners. Um, the tapestry itself is going to be woven out of stainless steel wire and it's a uh, really special alloy ca uh, called 317L which is particularly corrosion resistant. The mandate for this project is that it lasts at least 100 years, and this material is very long-lived, and <clears throat> it will maintain um, its, its luster when it's built, and then as it's maintained and cleaned along the way, it, it will maintain the same appearance. So um, the, the material itself is very uh, non-reactive to the environment, which is why we chose it. In terms of lighting design, um, we've produced a number of images, but we haven't produced the one that you're speaking of looking straight on. So um, that could be done, but we tr this is more how you'll experience the, the tapestry itself. It's lit from the bottom. Um, there's a rail out in front of the tapestry um, with LED lighting strips in it, and it'll be lit from the bottom and will fade toward the top. Um, one question I had when I saw this, I really appreciate the new design. It's more abstract. It lets a lot more light through. I think it's a lot more visually pleasing. But being that it is abstract, is there going to be any kind of interpretation anywhere on site so that people understand that they're looking at the Cliffs of Normandy and to give some context? Because that's the one thing that um, I kind of had a question about with relation to the, the very abstract nature of it. So I know there is a, 
uh, e-memorial that is a web-based web resource that will be part, uh, will complement the memorial. Uh, and the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, uh, in their website, they will have information about the Eisenhower legacy and also about the memorial components. So I believe it will be like a website that you can go to. And this was part of the memorandum of agreement. And I think some of the information about the design process is already on the website, and then they will include the interpretation piece. Mr. Gallus. Um, I'd like to thank the design team for responding to some of my concerns from the last time we saw this. I think that uh, you've gotten many things right now. Um, I'd like to touch on all four, if I may. Um, I think first, the tapestry. I think the subject matter is fascinating. Uh, the coastline of Normandy, uh, while maybe not understood by most Americans, I think will create a curiosity about history that will be uh, very much appreciated uh, through time. I also think that uh, it's now much more uh, recognizable, understandable, coherent as an image. I thought that the last one was really not successful in that regard. And clearly, uh, I thought our site visit today was very helpful to understand the transparency that um, is, exists with this design and this material. Um, I, I, I like the move of the young Eisenhower sculpture. Uh, I think it'll be much more visible there and much more appreciated by everybody b visiting the memorial. Um, the lighting, I would just say, is beautiful at night. I, I, I'm really excited about that. Um, I hope it's as beautiful as what we're seeing here today. If we can achieve that, uh, it will be a very dramatic place and a destination for everyone to, to uh, visit uh, many times in, in their visits to Washington. Um, I think my number four comment about the landscaping is really just a, some questions, because I, I'm noting that we've added trees back. I understand the strategy of a monument in the park. Um, but this is a huge tapestry. This thing is huge. And it does feel like by adding the trees back, we're trying to block its coherence. And I just would love to hear more about why. I heard the rationale, the monument, you know, the monument in the park. But uh, if we're if the focus is so much on this very dramatic and, and very large dominating tapestry, it, I'm trying to understand why we feel like we are also trying to hide it. Uh, in you know, the scale of this thing is, you know, almost incoherent unless you go there. You know, it's that big. And uh, if, if we're proud of what this tapestry is going to convey, I, I, I'm trying to figure out why we are what looks like trying to hide it behind the trees, except in the wintertime. If someone could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. OK, so um, these trees were back in the preliminary phase. They were strategically placed to frame the Maryland Avenue uh, views. And right now, there's all, they also complement the benches. Um, and regarding transparency, I believe the only change in species from uh, London Plain to Oak is this one in the middle. And it was to, I think, to anchor the site, tapestry in the middle, with a point to hawk in the center and provide more presence. Uh, and as you said, in the winter, it will have the, these trees are deciduous, so there, there will be no leaves. But I think the benefits for shading um, and also the concept of the memorial within a park, so they are a positive addition to the, to the memorial. So I think Craig Webb should probably try to speak a little bit more to the design intent. Yeah. 
Yes, so um, there, were, there was a dual mandate for this memorial site, one to create the memorial to Dwight D. Eisenhower, and the second was to create a great urban park. And we took on those two mandates very seriously. And the idea of creating a beautiful grove of trees um, that provided a lot of shade for the public, places to sit, um, and then creating view corridors both on the Maryland Avenue axes toward the Capitol as well as from the two entry points on the northeast and northwest into the memorial core itself um, were really important. Um, and then the views to the tapestry were always considered to be vignettes of specific views through the trees. Um, we felt that taking some of these trees out was important to opening up more of those views. Um, the Commission of Fine Arts, uh, which is composed of, there are three landscape architects on that, that commission, um, and there was a long discussion with, the commission, uh, with those commissioners about this, and their feeling was that providing shade um, and you know, creating this real sense of tree canopy and park space was very important. Um, we think that is important also, we agree with that. And so it's a balance between those two. Um, there will be, a, a, as that previous image showed, very important views opened up toward the center of the composition of the tapestry, um, which is Point de Hoc, and which is the main uh, thematic element. Um, and so we think that's the right balance. We, we agreed um, with the commissioners on the Commission of Fine Arts and agreed to, um, to maintain the trees. I'll say that the uh, the idea of framing Maryland Avenue uh, is a good idea. Um, I think it was accomplished without adding back those trees. Uh, I don't think that does anything to help that. Um, the notion of shade is certainly uh, an important piece. I don't know, I haven't counted all the trees in this park, but I'm guessing that everybody will understand this is a park with shade. I mean, there, there must be 50, 60 trees there. Um, uh, and adding four that I think uh, just, again, look like they are trying to block what um, maybe, the, maybe the original conception of this, uh, the Abilene version, the photographic version, uh, maybe there was an idea about, um, uh, you know, this vignette viewing, which I think will be a very real part of this. But it sort of belies the notion of the scale. If, if, you, if you wanted to say uh, we just want to have vignettes, then why have a 450 long uh, tapestry? 450 foot long tapestry just seems like okay, then we're denying one thing for another thing. And it seems like we've made um, a compromise that makes it difficult to understand. Thank you. Other commissioner's comments? <clears throat> Mr. Griffiths. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, just briefly, um, I also agree that the moving of the Young Eisenhower statue is a very strong move uh, and agree with the staff's comments that um, that uh, uh, reinforces the hierarchy and the pr procession through the memorial and I think it does set up uh, a very interesting and powerful gateway into this. Um, on the tapestry, I, I also think that um, seeing it today was very informative um, and I, I find the move to an abstracted image also very powerful because I believe that this will uh, enable uh, almost the timelessness of what is being shown and what is trying to be represented. Uh, one can connect with the literal image of what it is, but also it opens one's minds and thoughts up to much more in terms of its interpretation of an abstraction of that with the other pieces of this memorial. So I just wanted to state that I thought it is a very uh, impressive and, and productive move to uh, go to an abstraction in this image. And then to hear about the creativity and the artistic nature of how this is actually then going to be built, it also lends itself to another level and another layer of uh, what I think is a very rich uh, and powerful piece. Thank you. Ms. White. 
Yeah, I, I'd like to echo those comments. It was really fascinating to hear the complexity of how this tapestry is built and the patience required. And um, I believe the artist said the, the credit for patience goes to the machine that, <laughs> that makes it. But I think of the incredible patience and um, precision that Eisenhower had to take advantage of in planning the invasion. I really appreciate that the team listened about moving the statue and how it does create the procession, but also implying the journey that Eisenhower took as a um, from a young man to a general. So I again just want to appreciate say I appreciate the team listening and and uh, where we are with the design. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cash. Actually, I just want to echo with the uh, the statue placement. I think last time I kind of quipped that he the way he was positioned was his back was literally turned on education, and he was sitting in that promenade that I know a big part of the plan with all of this going on is that promenade will kind of be activated. But having worked downtown here around a lot of federal buildings, I know that the best laid plans, it, it might just not happen. So I'm glad that he's not going to be kind of hanging out there alone anymore. Uh, I, I also wanted to kind of maybe be a little bit contrarian on the trees. I actually walked over to the field trip this morning from City Hall down here. It was a nice cool day, and I got down there a little bit earlier than you all and there it was a complete lack of trees out there and it was I mean I think the the shade in the urban park concept could could really be strengthened by I mean kind of providing that shade and I think that one of the comments I had while we were out there was it's gonna be hard I think to see the full tapestry in any one place anyway like you pretty much have to be back at Independence Avenue to kind of get the full the full scale and you'll never be able to see it with any trees there so um, I think that, that there is a balance there to, to get a few more trees if we're really trying to reinforce the urban park feel. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Can I add one thing? Please. I, I appreciate that. I think maybe you were sweating from the walk more than the space <laughs> because there was, no, there was no sun in the space. I mean, this is a north-facing plaza, which means no sun directly most of the day. So I think the the notion of shade, while it's a, a great thing, and I appreciate it more than as much as anyone, um, um, I, I think it seems uh, overwrought for what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you for listening. I promise I'll be brief, because as I've said many times, I've had my say. Um, a couple of things, though. I think they... Um, I, 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 GSA has supported this design from the beginning. I, I had difficulty um, on with the last iteration, and so I'm so glad to see also for all the reasons that you eloquently stated, the the um, what to me is a, almost a return to abstraction because I have to say I thought the the, the Abilene trees were just sublime. <clears throat> and would have been um, really theatrical and beautiful in the winter, which is a hard thing to do. So I was, I was putting my, taking a leap of faith in the ability of the artist, which I think is warranted, um, in, in supporting the last iteration, but I'm really glad to support this one again. Um, and I, I, I guess, I think the tortured um, path of this memorial design owes something to, and I'm glad Mr. Schubau brought it up, um, the Commemorative Works Act, which it's time to revisit. And Mr. May and I have had many discussions about a top to bottom review of the CWA under the auspices of NICMAC, the um, National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission, and I look forward to that review because I, I don't think people should be forced to suffer the extent to which the, the design team and everyone involved in this memorial, um, I think we could do a lot to, um, to uh, reduce the, the, the anxiety around memorial design and construction, which is considerable no matter what, what, what the subject, by, by making um, some tweaks to the CWA. But 
we're here now, and um, I can wholeheartedly, on behalf of GSA, support this design. I hope we're finally there. May. Uh, well, I, I thank you very much. Um, I just would like to share a few words of uh, thanks to everybody who's worked on this project over the uh, many years. It's been a, an active project in all my years in the Park Service. Uh, and we are reaching a significant milestone today um, with this review. So um, thanks to the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, to the design team, to all the folks at GSA who worked on it, uh, to the NCPC staff who worked uh, very diligently, especially uh, in the, the uh, stages when we were going through the testing of the uh, materials. I think that was really an extraordinary effort on the part of the uh, uh, NCPC staff, uh, also the Park Service staff who worked on this, and it's uh, partially my staff, uh, in particular Glenn DeMar, who I can't quite spot in the audience, but I hope he's here somewhere, um, who has been working on this for a lot longer, I think, than, than uh, anybody else in the Park Service, uh, and, uh, and the staff of the National Mall Memorial Parks as well, um, who have been reviewing this very carefully, and, and uh, after today, Theoretically, the ball is in their hands to take the next step uh, toward issuing a permit. Uh, and of course, all the members of the public who took the time and effort to uh, work with us in developing the design, uh, well, and even selecting the site and working on the design, and, and I think working to make the design better. And uh, I appreciate the fact that the whole process uh, is difficult and it creates a fair amount of anxiety for all those people involved with it, but I think that uh, to a certain extent that's simply the nature of how we <coughs> must go through the commemorative process. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can go very smoothly, but uh, more often than not there are twists and turns that nobody expects and uh, it takes a lot of people pushing in the same direction uh, eventually and uh, a lot of coaxing to get people who are maybe not pushing in the same direction to, to help push in the same direction. So um, anyway, I'm glad to see that at this point we're preparing to move forward. And uh, if I missed anybody in my words of thanks, I thank everybody else who's possibly listening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. May. I'll just make a couple of comments. One is um, if I were on the Commission of Fine Arts uh, now, I would enthusiastically support the revised uh, imagery on the well, the tapestry, I say that quite uh, quite uh, seriously. Um, I think it's uh, it's really quite nice. Um, and I do share Mr. Gallus's concerns about the trees. I'm usually one who um, is a big supporter of the trees. But if the two trees noted that are closest to the tapestry were not to be planted, uh, that would be okay. Uh, if the other, the other three could uh, perhaps be fine. That might help with the ability to appreciate the, the fuller breadth of the of the tapestry. Anyway, those are my comments. Uh, I think the the revisions to the EDR are are quite good. Um, is there a motion on the EDR as written? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the EDR, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Lee, very much. Thank you. Good. General Riddell, nice to see you. Mr. Webb. Thank you, and I just thank all of you as commissioners and as citizens for helping us memorialize one of the greatest projects we've ever produced. Thank you, sir. Agenda item 5B is the approval of preliminary and final site and building plans for the Carnegie Library Rehabilitation. We have Mr. Fliss. Welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Events DC of the District of Columbia has submitted uh, preliminary and final site and building plans for the Carnegie Library. The final design presents an opportunity to rehabilitate and modernize the Carnegie Library 
to accommodate new retail events and educational uses for a new uh, tenant, Apple. The project was reviewed by you um, at your June meeting uh, with the Commission Supporting Events DC uh, concept design. So just as a reminder, Carnegie Library is located in uh, downtown Washington, D.C. in Mount Vernon Square, uh, just south of the Washington Convention Center. As you can see on this map, uh, Massachusetts Avenue and New York Avenue come together at the square, uh, which creates a, a pretty visually prominent location. So zooming in just a little bit closer, you can see uh, Carnegie Library, the building here at the center of the square with the Convention Center to the north. Um, Events DC holds administrative jurisdiction over the library building. Uh, while Mount Vernon Square, which is designated as Reservation 8, remains federally owned, but it is administered by the District of Columbia. Here are some images of the existing building. Uh, many of you are familiar with it. Again, Events DC retains office space in the Carnegie Library and uses the public space for events. The other tenant is the Historical Society of Washington, which operates uh, its research library, exhibit galleries, and administrative offices. Following the rehabilitation, the building will le be leased jointly by both the Historic Society as well as Apple. The Carnegie Library was listed in the District of Columbia Inventory of uh, Historic Sites in 1964 and the National Register of Historic Places in 1969. Um, it was the uh, central public library. The design of the building reflects a Beaux-Arts style, uh, which became fashionable at the end of the 19th century, particularly for community landmark buildings such as city halls, courthouses, and as well as libraries. So now I'm going to walk you through the changes since you uh, last reviewed the project, uh, providing some of staff's analysis and recommendations. I'm going to discuss the historic environmental considerations, as well as the exterior design changes, as well as um, the site improvements, signage, and wayfinding. First, I'll note that because NCPC um, has an approval authority, NCPC is the lead federal agency for compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, as well as the National Historic Preservation Act. Since the Commission's review of the concept plans, Events DC and NCPC uh, released the environmental assessment um, to receive public input, and a finding of no significant impact will document the completion of this process. In terms of Section 106, a memorandum, a memorandum of agreement uh, to resolve the ad adverse effects will be signed to conclude that process. So regarding the proposed improvements, um, in general, as I mentioned at uh, concept review, the project scope is limited to the rehabilitation of the building exterior and uh, changes to non-historic elements. Much of the proposed work will also be on the interior of the building, which is not subject to commission review. Under the proposed plan, the glazing on the historic uh, skylights will be repaired and replaced and the uh, roof will be repaired as well. The 2003 clear story addition over the atrium, which is on the center of the building, will uh, also be removed. The original wood windows will be repaired and non-original glazing will be replaced and also made operable. The exterior stone masonry will uh, further be cleaned and restored. So here's a rendering of the south elevation um, as envisioned once the rehabilitation is uh, completed. Uh, we believe the exterior work will help maintain the original and historic character defining features of the building. It will also be in keeping with the Secretary of Interior standards for uh, rehabilitation. In particular, historic fabric will be retained where possible or replaced with in-kind materials uh, when necessary. So we mentioned at the concept review that um, the library was altered by both the University of the District of Columbia as well as the City Museum projects with the addition of a stair, canopy, and alterations to the windows and structure, and you can see some of that in the image in front of you. Um, these will be removed and replaced. So under the new proposal, the design of the reconfigured north elevation stair has been changed slightly. Uh, previously was in a triangular shape, but now it is going to be more rectangular, a little simpler in form um, in that northern side of the building. The new, stone, uh, the new stair will be made of stone uh, with bronze handrails and a glass balustrade with uh, attached handrail will enclose the stair at the back um, towards the building. A small glass canopy is proposed over the new uh, north elevation and an ADA lift has been uh, incorporated to the west of the reconfigured stairs which will replace the existing ramp which is on the east side. So here's a perspective um, looking west. You can see the new stairs leading up to the entrance. 
So moving on, as part of the concept approval, the commission uh, requested that Events DC explore opportunities for additional landscaping design and pedestrian amenities in Mount Vernon Square as part of the evaluation of alternatives for both the NEPA and the 106 process. In developing the EA, the applicant discussed with the District Department of Transportation uh, the possibility of creating mid-block uh, mid pedestrian crossings on both K Street as well as Mount Vernon Place. DDOT indicated that the mid-block crossing, crossings in these locations were not feasible due to the existing traffic flow constraints and other challenges around Mount Vernon Square. Um, DDOT, DDOT also indicated that other transportation planning initiatives, uh, such as the future streetcar um, extension in this area, would preclude the feasibility of a pedestrian crossing at this location. Zooming in further on the site itself, um, the current configuration of Mount Vernon Square's layout of sidewalks, paths, and green spaces would generally be maintained, but it would be restored and rehabilitated. Um, the applicant is also committed to another, a, a number of other improvements since your last review. For, the, for example, the green areas uh, will be reseeded and resodded with new grass. Um, an undersized tree in K Street will be replaced with a new, larger, healthier tree. And then several trees around uh, along the north side of Mount Vernon Place will be removed and replaced in kind. Um, across the entire site, the existing irrigation system will be retrofitted um, to be fed from rainwater collected from the roof. And then also um, new perennial and shrub plantings are proposed uh, around the building itself. I'll also note that um, new hedges and screening is also proposed to shield um, some of the mechanical and um, cooling equipment. On the south side of the site, um, the plaza area, I had mentioned a concept review. This is going to be adjusted in slope to allow for better accessibility. And there's a, a current uh, non-historic metal switchback ramp, which will be removed as well. The site plan, um, as I have mentioned, also indicates that the ADA, ADA ramp on the north side will be removed, but it will be replaced with a, a lift on the north side. Events DC is also in the process of developing a mem memorandum of understanding with the district regarding future management and operations of the square. Um, they have expressed a strong interest in working with the district and the tenants of the building to improve and activate the site through appropriate programming um, on the square grounds. So staff notes that any improvements in public space will also require a public space permit and coordination with uh, the District Department of Transportation Office of Public Space. The applicant is also going to be upgrading uh, much of the site's furnishings. Um, you can see some of the images here on the screen. This will include new benches um, to replace the existing ones, as well as some additional new seating. New trash cans will be provided, um, and they'll be also updating some of the uh, light fixtures to match the Washington Globe fixtures on site. Events DC will also be uh, installing back, uh, bike racks on the site on the north side. Um, this will allow for 48 visitors as well as 32 employee spaces. Um, further, Events DC is also coordinating with DDOT to provide an, uh, a location for a capital bike share station, which would not be on the square, but would be in close proximity. Uh, as part of the concept review, the Commission also requested Events DC provide some information about proposed signage. Um, the applicant has submitted a signage package, um, and staff feels that it is appropriate to the historic setting of Mount Vernon Square. Um, this includes a variety of site identification signs, accessibility entrance signs, um, and all of these will be uh, designed in the same character and the same material as a, a, a bronze finish. There will also be a tenant sign for the Historical Society on the south side of the entrance. Um, the applicant is also proposing four paired uh, logo banners, and these are highlighted here in red. Um, these will uh, both indicate Apple as well as the Historical Society. Um, and these will be located on both the north and south sides of the building. And here's another image that just shows you the site elevations with the um, proposed banners. On the south elevation, uh, two tenant signs for Apple are, are proposed. Um, and these are uh, the arrows are pointing to those on the screen. Um, these will be consisting of uh, new marble panels uh, to match the existing building marble with internally illuminated white Apple logos. Um, these new panels are about five feet by three feet uh, wide, uh, tall and wide, and the anchor points will be um, to the existing grout joints. 
On the north elevation, one tenant sign for Apple is proposed. Um, this will be an acrylic Apple logo with a bronze trim, which will be applied to the glass above the entrance canopy. And this is about three feet by two feet. In conclusion, staff is recommending the commission approve the project as Events DC has been responsive to the commission's comments, as well as comments from the other review agencies and through the Section 106 consulting parties process. Overall, the proposed exterior modifications are generally modest and intended to rehabilitate the existing Carnegie Library in a way that is uh, sensitive both to its histor historic, uh, historic character and legacy. And throughout the design development process, Events DC has worked to ba balance these historic preservation issues while transforming and re, uh, renovating the building. And therefore, it is the executive director's recommendation that the commission approve Events DC's vision to rehabilitate and modernize the Carnegie Library. Notes that the Mount Vernon's existing landscape will re be restored and rehabilitated following the project, that Events DC will work with the district on future programming and management of Mount Vernon Square. Staff further notes that any changes to the final plans will be required to be resubmitted to the Commission for review and that any improvements to public space will require a public space permit through the District Department of Transportation. That concludes my presentation. Representatives from Events DC, Apple, and the consultant team are also here to help answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. Uh, we have no public comment, but uh, Mr. Shaw. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Um, I also want to thank the design team and Events DC for being really responsive to the idea that, um, first of all, the renderings are so beautiful I wanted to cry. I just, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one who falls in love with renderings, but holy moly, um, that's a crown jewel right there. That's definitely a crown jewel for the district, and I'm, I'm happy that, that that's part of our, our, our portfolio. Um, yeah, but the idea that we are looking at the programming and the landscape, that's, that's um, that's important, and I want to say publicly that I'll continue to work with DDOT to make sure that they're also accountable on, on that end, um, really making sure we get this space to be um, enjoyed by everyone. Um, there's a lot of trees here, too, for shade, Mr. Cash. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and maybe this will just be going for it for some of this, is the square itself outside the building is so dynamic with just people and traffic and noise that it's never, ever going to feel like this. Um, and so I just, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine with taxis and honking and Ubers and, and conventioneers, um, and I think, think it actually makes it more fun. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sparkle um, in the middle of all of that. So um, I'm, I'm imagining that myself, but it would be good for future sort of design and representation that we really um, are honest about how our city functions, and it doesn't sort of function on these sort of pristine plots now. So. Quick comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, I absolutely agree. These are absolutely beautiful images, and it's a beautiful building. Uh, and I am a very strong uh, supporter of this uh, whole project. Um, perhaps outside of our jurisdiction at NCPC, I just wanted to make a note that this is a great example of a public-private partnership, where the city has come together with a private industry to do something of this nature. And I think that is so important to. Uh, uh, draw attention to to see uh, how it might be replicated across the city and in other cities. Pardon me? The Historical Society is a nonprofit. Yes, indeed. I, and I, pardon me for not even mentioning it, but that's exactly right. It uh, adds to that entire team uh, and to the strength of, of, of what that is. Um, so uh, I would just say I also applaud the mayor and her administration for holding strong uh, as forces worked against this in many ways to get us to where we are today and so that we can see this uh, and hopefully I would anticipate approve it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's right. Um, I just want to also quickly say, aside from all of the fabulosity of the design, which mm -hmm. we're not supposed to talk about today, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love the fact that, that the Apple Store and the Historical Society are in the same yeah. place. So for those, of, uh, those people who think that preservationists are all a bunch of pearl necklace biddies, they'll go in and they'll see that it's, a, that it's a dynamic organization that does important stuff while they're getting their phones fixed. And I think that's a great thing. Other comments? Hearing none, is there a motion on the EDR? 
It's been moved and seconded that we approve the EDR, which is for the preliminary and final site and building plans. All in favor of the EDR say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Another good project. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. Agenda item 5C is approval of comments on the concept design for the central parking facility at the National Zoo. That's brought to us by the Smithsonian Institution. And we have Mr. Gerbich. All right. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution has submitted concept plans for a new central parking facility at the National Zoological Park in Northwest Washington, D.C. They're seeking approval of additional visitor parking spaces to help better meet anticipated parking demand at the zoo, as well as comments on a draft design and massing for the facility. I'd like to start with providing a brief overview of the topics that will be covered today. I'll be talking through the facility location, planning history, submission proposal, and staff analysis. I'll conclude with the executive director's recommendation to the commission. The National Zoo is located adjacent to the neighborhoods of Cleveland Park and Woodley Park in Northwest Washington, DC. The proposal today focuses specifically on a central parking facility, which is highlighted here in red. The facility would be constructed above an existing surface parking lot, parking lot C, at the north end of the zoo. This lot sits on top of the zoo's general services building, which is built into the hillside along North Road, the central road for vehicular circulation through the zoo. The zoo is generally bounded by Connecticut Avenue Northwest and Klingland Adams Mill Roads Northwest. It can be accessed from a uh, main entrance off of Connecticut Avenue and a secondary entrance from Harvard Street to the east. Two metro rail stations provide transit access to the zoo, uh, Cleveland Park Metro and the Woodley Park Zoo Adams Morgan Metro, which are marked here with red circles. Each station is an approximately half mile walk to the Connecticut Avenue entrance. The National Zoo sits within Rock Creek Park, which is a unit of the National Park Service. The proposed parking garage would be constructed immediately adjacent to Rock Creek's scenic beach drive marked on this map with a green line. This roadway uh, winds along the Rock Creek Stream Valley, which contains dense vegetation and sensitive riparian habitat. The Smithsonian completed a comprehensive facilities master plan in 2008, which was reviewed and approved by the commission in June of 2008. Around that time, the zoo had experienced a significant bump in visitation, which hit a then peak of 2.6 million annual visitors in both 2006 and 2007. The Smithsonian anticipated at that time that visitation would continue to increase and planned to expand visitor facilities to accommodate 3.5 million annual visitors by 2027 to 2032. This assumption informed the primary proposals in the master plan, including a major emphasis on parking reconfiguration. In the master plan, the Smithsonian proposed consolidating four of its five sur surface parking lots into two proposed parking garages. The reclaimed parking areas were then intended to be used as a combination of new animal habitat and stormwater management. This proposal is shown on these maps. Um, under the proposal, surface lots A, B, C, and D, shown on the left, would be consolidated into a subsurface structure under lot A and an above ground structure on top of lot C. Surface lot E would be retained as would a small staff parking area at the zoo's research hill. This proposal is shown on the right with the retained surface parking areas highlighted with red dash boxes. To meet anticipated demand, the Smithsonian requested 1,620 parking spaces, an increase of 732 spaces from the existing 888 which they estimated would meet future parking demand by 80, would meet future parking demand 85% of the time and would be insufficient 15% of the time or 55 days a year. In its review of this proposal, the commission decided to disapprove a total of 335 spaces including the subsurface structure below lot A, citing an insufficient traffic analysis and the accompanying transportation management plan or TMP as the sole rationale. In its review of the master plan, the commission ultimately approved 1,285 parking spaces for the zoo. I'll get into the breakdown of visitor versus um, employee and volunteer spaces later in the presentation. 
Since completion of the master plan, the Commission reviewed and approved a retaining wall at the location of the proposed parking garage along the North Road in June 2012. The wall was intended to replace a failing temporary shoring wall and provided structural reinforcement for the general services building below. As indicated in these photos, the project included landscaping berms and plantings to soften the wall's appearance and provide stormwater management. The wall will ultimately serve as structural stability for the proposed parking garage. The proposal before the Commission today has two main components. The first is a request to increase the number of parking spaces at the National Zoo. And the second is a request for comments on a rough concept design and massing for the central parking facility. I'll first review the increase in parking spaces. Today, with 888 spaces, the National Zoo would only meet anticipated parking demand 64% of the time, based on a future estimate of 3.5 million annual visitors by 2027 to 2032. With the original master plan request of 1,620 spaces, the zoo would meet future demand 85% of the time. As previously noted, NCPC only approved 1,285 spaces of this original request in its review of the master plan, um, which would only meet parking demand 75% of the time. Under this approval, it is estimated that parking would be insufficient 25% of the time or 91 days of the year. This information is summarized in the table on this slide. The Smithsonian has indicated that 91 days of inadequate parking where zoo staff must turn away vehicles is contrary to the National Zoo educational mission and detrimental to adjacent neighborhoods that are burdened by spillover parking from displaced visitors. To help better meet demand, the Smithsonian is currently asking for 166 additional visitor parking spaces for a total of 1,451 spaces across the facility. This is roughly half of the number of spaces that were disapproved in the master plan. No changes from the 2008 approval are proposed for employees or volunteer parking, which would meet the one to four NCPC parking ratio for this facility. Under the current proposal, parking would meet future demand approximately 81% of the time, and parking lots would be at capacity approximately 19% of the time, or 69 days. This is a reduction of 21 days in which vehicles must be turned away. The Smithsonian completed an updated transportation analysis to address earlier commission concerns, which will be described later in the presentation. Though the initial disapproval of 335 spaces was tied to a lack of traffic analysis, staff believes that the current request for an additional 166 spaces should be evaluated more comprehensively, looking at not only traffic impacts, but also overall mode share, visitation and transportation data, and most importantly, the transportation demand management strategies or TDM strategies that will accommodate an additional 1 million people coming into the zoo in the next 10 to 15 years, which the zoo is anticipating. Staff has found that there is rationale for the increase of 166 spaces, but is focusing its recommendation on the larger strategy to manage visitation into the future. As previously noted, the commission, um, the commission tied its disapproval of 335 spaces in the 2008 master plan to inadequate traffic analysis in the accompanying TMP. To address this concern, the Smithsonian has prepared and submitted a new transportation study, which indicates that such an increase would have only minimal impacts on adjacent roadways should TDM strategies that are included in the analysis be implemented, which will be described later. The District Department of Transportation has reviewed this analysis and supports its conclusions, and staff, fi staff finds that it adequately addresses previous commission concerns. As a next step in the evaluation process, staff explored policies related to visitor parking. While the transportation element of the Federal Comprehensive Plan has strong policies related to employee parking at federal facilities, it does not provide a metric for visitor parking that could be used to determine the appropriate number of spaces at the zoo. Absent a federal policy, staff reached out to DDOT to see how the district government might handle this request. DDOT indicated that there is no clear district guidance that could be used as a proxy, citing the unique use and context of the facility. Staff then proceeded to, re proceeded to review the site context and demographics of zoo visitors. The National Zoo is relatively unique among federal facilities in Washington because it's surrounded by residential neighborhoods and sensitive natural habitat in Rock Creek Park, with limited public or shared parking options available. The typical user is not an employee in a single occupancy vehicle, but instead a family with young children. 
Surveys indicate that zoo visitors average 2.7 people per vehicle and that 61% of visitor groups include children. Additionally, only 30% of visitors are coming from DC neighborhoods adjacent to the zoo or inner suburbs, which means a majority of visitors do not have easy access to transit. For those that can access the zoo by transit, steep topography, sloping terrain, and overall distance make navigation with the family difficult. The nearest metro rail stations are a half mile walk from the zoo entrance. Once visitors arrive at the zoo, they must still traverse the approximately one mile Olmsted walk that provides access to exhibits, as well as the additional walk around attractions. The pedestrian circulation map on the right shows the extent of visitor pathways throughout the zoo. To get an understanding of the current trends in visitation and travel mode, staff then proceeded to assess new visitation data. As previously noted, Smithsonian based its 2008 master plan proposal on the assumption that visitation would increase to 3.5 million by 2027 to 2032. Since several years have elapsed since that estimate, staff wanted to ensure that this assumption was still supported by new visitor data. Visitor counts indicate that visitation dropped from its 2006-2007 peak of 2.6 million visitors in the years immediately following the NCPC master plan approval, but there has been an upward trend since that time, reaching a new peak of 2.7 million in 2016. NCPC staff believes that the assumption that visitation could reach 3.5 million is still valid given events and activities planned for the zoo, as well as population forecasts for the region. The Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments predicts that regional population will grow significantly in the coming decades, reaching a total population of just over 6 million by 2025 and continuing to more than 6.8 million by 2045. Should this population growth translate to an increase in zoo visitation, a comprehensive transportation strategy is needed that places greater emphasis on alternative transportation as a means to meet visitation demand. The National Zoo has been successful with reducing parking demand through the implementation of TDM strategies in the past. In preparation of its master plan in 2007, the Smithsonian noted that 65% of zoo visitors arrived via automobile, while 22% took metro rail and 12% walked. These figures showed a clear preference for vehicular travel. More recent data shows that there has generally been a reduction in automobile use as a share of mode split, with a 2016 visitor survey noting a rate of 53%. While progress has been made, the Smithsonian has indicated that the parking supply remains a problem. As parking lots reach capacity on busy days, staff closes vehicular entry to the zoo and directly manages traffic and parking. Groups of vehicles are then pulsed through the gates as other vehicles leave, and staff directs them to open lots. While, ma many, while many vehicles wait for entry, others have looked for parking elsewhere, which in many cases includes on-street spaces on nearby residential streets. Based on visitor surveys, as many as 33% of visitors are parking in adjacent neighborhoods. NCPC has received a number of comments that support an increase to help reduce such impacts, including comments from District Council members Che and Nadeau, a letter from Advisory Neighborhood Commission 3C, and 39 individual comments from area residents. Given its unique context and visitor demographics, staff is recommending that the commission supports an additional 166 spaces to help meet visitor demand in the short term. However, staff believes that a, a longer term comprehensive transportation strategy is needed to accommodate the additional 1 million visitors that are anticipated in the next 10 to 15 years. To meet this demand, the Smithsonian will um, need to implement the TDM strategies that are proposed in its recent tra transportation analysis. Such strategies include working with DDOT to provide a stop for the DC circulator at the National Zoo, extending a shuttle bus to Cleveland Park Metro Station, and eliminating free parking for zoo employees. But staff believes that more innovative approaches are needed to promote alternative transportation and reduce parking demand into the future. Accordingly, staff recommends that the commission request that the Smithsonian update the TDM strategies outlined in the 2008 TMP and 2007 transportation analysis within two years to include strategies such as demand-based pricing for parking, timed entry passes for vehicles, storage lockers for visitors without personal vehicles, um, dedicated areas for rideshare pickup and drop-off, reconsideration of unlimited free parking for zoo members, and improved navigational signage and wayfinding for bicycles. 
Further, staff recommends that the commission requires that the Smithsonian demonstrate measurable progress over time in reducing vehicular travel as a share of total mode split among zoo visitors before any future, fu further future parking increases are considered by the commission. The second component of the proposal is the conceptual design and massing of the central parking facility. To be clear, this is not a typical concept design. The Smithsonian is simply requesting comments from the commission at this time, which will be used to inform a request for proposal or RFP for a public-private partnership team that will ultimately design, operate, and maintain the facility. A true concept design for the garage will be submitted for commission review as the process continues. The Smithsonian is proposing an approximately 118,000 square foot garage that would contain 1,285 visitor spaces distributed across six floors. The general services building would continue to sit at the base of the garage, serving as the primary structural support for the facility. Level one would be the existing surface parking lot and would be the largest level. Level two would be the smallest, and levels three through six would get progressively smaller as they go higher, which ultimately serves to minimize visibility of the higher floors. The Smithsonian has emphasized in the submission that this is simply one possibility for a garage massing that could accommodate the 1,285 spaces, and that alternatives will be explored as the design process continues. Overall, the additional 166 spaces have only added about 13% additional mass to the structure, which was approved as part of the master plan. Here's an elevation that shows the central parking facility massing from the north road at the interior of the zoo. As you can see, the lowest levels of the garage would not be visible from the zoo at all due to sloping topography, and a large portion of the higher levels would also be obscured. This image shows the central parking facility in plan view, as well as a rough proposal for vegetative screening that would obscure views of the garage from the zoo. A proposed bridge from the facility to Olmsted Walk across North Road can also be seen here, the details of which will be further developed as part of the design process. Highlighted here in orange is the location of an office tower that was proposed as part of the master plan, though it's important to note that this is not being pursued as part of this proposal. This massing model shows an aerial view of what the proposed garage might look like from across Beach Drive. As you can see here, the garage sits at a topographic high point and is surrounded by dense vegetation in Rock Creek Park. From this vantage point, I want to reemphasize that the garage is proposed above an existing parking lot in a previously disturbed area of the zoo. To guide analysis of the design and massing of the central parking facility, staff first considered its context. As previously noted, there are significant topographic shifts in this northern area of the zoo. The garage would sit at the end of a steep slope that leads down to a sensitive riparian area in the adjacent Rock Creek Stream Valley. Across the creek is the beach drive portion of Rock Creek Park, which is shown here on the right, and another steep slope up to Klingle and Adams Mill Roads in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood of Washington. Viewshed analyses submitted by the Smithsonian indicate that despite this visually prominent location, the garage could be largely screened to minimize visual impacts at many key locations, including Klingle and Adams Mill Roads, which are shown here. <clears throat> As indicated in views one, two, and three, even when trees have no foliage, the garage could not be seen from Klingle Road. Views four and five show that the garage would be visible, but largely screened by tree cover from Klingle Road. As can be seen in these photos, the top of the garage could be seen from segments of Olmstead Walk near North Road, though proposed vegetation may provide screening to minimize visual impact. Additional submitted photos indicate that it could not be seen from a majority of the interior areas of the zoo. Of the views provided in the submission, the garage is most clearly visible from the <laughs> North Road, which runs along the retaining wall in, proposed, or in parking lot C. You can also see the proposed bridge here that would provide pedestrian-friendly access from the garage to the zoo. While the submitted viewshed analysis provides a reasonable assessment of visibility from surrounding neighborhoods in the zoo itself, staff believes that the visual importance of the Beach Drive corridor necessitates additional views from Rock Creek Park. Accordingly, staff recommends that the commission request that for the next submission, the Smithsonian submits an updated viewshed analysis that includes views from Beach Drive and adjacent recreational trails, as well as alternative garage treatments uh, that would reduce visual impacts. 
Because of the adjacent natural habitat, including the Rock Creek Stream Valley and densely vegetated natural areas in Rock Creek Park, staff further believes that the parking garage should be developed to effectively reduce stormwater runoff and emphasize sustainability. Accordingly, staff recommends that the commission request that in the continued development of the garage, the Smithsonian pursues the design and massing that would minimize visual intrusion from Olmsted Walk and Rock Creek Park, with particular emphasis on views from Beach Drive and adjacent recreational trails. Protects the adjacent natural habitat by retaining and treating stormwater on site to eliminate runoff in Rock Creek. And follows best management practices related to low impact development and sustainability, such as incorporation of green roofs, vegetated walls, and solar infrastructure. In conclusion, it's the executive director's recommendation that the commission generally notes that the National Zoo is requesting an increase in the number of parking spaces approved for the facility and that a majority of existing surface lots will be consolidated into a central parking facility. Notes that the location and use of the zoo is unique among federal facilities and that additional visitation demand will require a comprehensive transportation strategy that places greater emphasis on alternative transportation. Supports the increase in parking spaces to better accommodate parking demand in the short term, but finds that long-term solutions are needed to reduce parking demand into the future. Finds that the zoo is currently taking steps to reduce parking demand, such as working to provide a DC circulator stop at the zoo, extending a shuttle bus to Cleveland Park, um, and eliminating free parking for employees. Request that the Smithsonian updates its TDM strategies to include creative approaches to promoting alternative transportation and reducing parking demand. Requires that the Smithsonian show progress over time in reducing vehicular travel as a share of, travel, of total mode split before submitting any future parking increases. With regard to the design and massing of the garage, the commission notes that the proposed garage sits at a topographic high point and further requests that the Smithsonian pursue a design and massing that minimizes visual intrusions from important scenic corridors, retain and treat stormwater on site to eliminate runoff into Rock Creek, and follow best management practices related to low impact development and sustainability. For further reviews, request that the, the Smithsonian submit an updated viewshed analysis and provide alternative garage treatments to reduce visual impacts. I'd like to reiterate that these comments will be used to inform the RFP process for the selection of a team to design the central parking facility, which will be submitted for commission review at a later date. Um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'm available for questions as are representatives from the National Zoo and uh, the Smithsonian. Thank you, Mr. Gerbich. We have uh, one person signed up to speak, uh, Mr. Zachary Israel. Is Mr. Israel here? Mr. Israel? That closes the public comment period. Um, we have members of uh, Smithsonian here, Ms. Trowbridge and, and others as well. Uh, Mr. Shaw, then Mr. May. What a fun commission meeting for me. This is, these are all the, um, can you go back to the parking um, recommendations? For the, for the spaces? Or for yeah, for the spaces. So one, um, so um, as to the east, once again, our, our Mount Pleasant, you know, so it's now just Whitley Park and Cleveland Park, and we wanted to make sure that we understood this sort of also worked there, and so I'm glad we got Councilmember Nadeau's office and Mary Jay's office in this. Um, and, you know, I think we understand the need. In an informal survey of the people of children in my, my office, I just, I want us to be really mindful that this is a zoo. <laughs> and so as, I feel like a lot of the recommendations we had for the parking, if you go one more time, for the charging and this, I mean, like, there, there really is a limitation on, to me, on how many families can use shuttles and bikes and these kind of things. And, and so for me, and understanding that there really is an, an identification, there's no attraction like this um, within sort of the Smithsonian system, I'm not, against charging for parking or against those ideas, but I really think that our recommendations need to be sort of in line with also zoo best practices and our, our similar attractions. Um, you, you know what I mean? It's a constrained site. It's going to grow how it grows, but I'm not going to call those, those recommendations harsh, but I feel like we need to have some deeper conversations around the idea of zoo management, traffic management. Um, those things before we lay recommendations about charging and 
and those other things. I just feel like there needs to be a little bit more context for that. That's just um, just for 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 what, something that I'm seeing sure. um, there. So I want to make sure if, if before we sort of say we won't consider any other transit models, that we really find some best practices with equivalent attractions um, to help shape that recommendation um, a little bit more. So yeah, and we recognize the unique nature of the facility, and that was that was kind of this whole the whole process. We're talking, you know, looking at our policies, looking at DDOT policies. We also did look at equivalent, um, you know, zoos with similar access to transit, and kind of saw what they were doing. Okay. It's why ultimately we're recommending the approval, um, but why we're recommending that let's like, maybe explore some different ways that that can happen in the future. How how might it be managed? None of it is. It's just kind of considering those possibilities, and that might involve you know looking at at you know equivalents of different zoos too so and, and then the other thing I would just say too is I think the introduction of technology now you know when you go to the airport it tells you which stations are open and how many are there that you know I hope that either in the design of the structure as well and in thinking of this that you know is there less idling and less circling circling now because we have the technology to tell you where to go um, so in the instance that um, we're adding more parking but we can actually make that parking be more smart um, to reduce some of these potential issues as well. So I would hope that we can either add that as a recommendation or I could be put on the record as something for both the design and for some of the consideration for the additional um, spaces we're putting in. So to clarify, that's actually already in their TDM strategy. Okay. So they're looking at doing that as part of the P3 process. Uh, so first of all, let me say um, the uh, Park Service is sensitive to the um, to the dilemma, uh, given the, the context and uh, the, the desire and the need to accommodate the zoo's visitors. Uh, and it's certainly a, a, an issue that the Park Service struggles with across the system. I mean, there are parallels between this and what occurs in other parks, not really in this area, but certainly out west there are parks where we are struggling with the number of people who want to come and the, our capacity to park them and, and our capacity actually to have the people there. So it's, uh, there are similarities there, so we're certainly sensitive to that issue. Um, and I think that, you know, based on the information that we have now, we're okay with this more modest increase than what would have been previously um, proposed. But I would also say that this is a uh, substantial um, design challenge, uh, both technically and in terms of the aesthetics and how it's, how it's perceived, uh, how this uh, parking structure will be viewed. And uh, I, I believe that the, the, uh, the, the Smithsonian is taking the right approach in, in uh, trying to incorporate uh, these, you know, the, the complexities from the start and trying to find a solution that, uh, that addresses all of the, the concerns and is as smart a parking solution as possible, um, but is also not one that's driven by uh, kind of, you know, bare bones, bottom line, um, parking garage construction, which, you know, the, the examples of that um, are uh, numerous. Um, I would say um, that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the EDR does not specifically mention or require, request, whatever, that uh, further coordination with the Park Service. Uh, and while I would ordinarily like to see that. I know that in, in this case we have had extensive coordination and, and uh, we've talked about how we can be involved moving forward um, in, uh, in this unusual process for getting a, a structure like this built and up and running. Uh, so I'm confident that that will happen. Um, the, uh, I will also say that I do not believe that uh, uh, this, these extra spaces will ultimately fix the problem. Uh, completely. It would still be a challenge, uh, and unfortunately I think building just a lot more spaces isn't going to solve it either because it's, a, it's sort of a build it and they will come situation. You'll get more and more cars coming if there's more and more parking, uh, and it won't necessarily solve the problem for the neighbors. We saw lots of testimony from the neighbors in the, in the record, and I think that's all good, but this is not going to fix it all completely. I think to the neighbors there has to be a more concerted effort on the part of other district agencies to get control of parking in those neighborhoods. So they need to continue to work with DDOT and DPW to get um, the right uh, parking controls and uh, RPP, uh, sorry, speaking in acronyms, residential parking permits. Um, 
system and the, getting the signage right and alternate sides of the street and, and all of those uh, uh, innovations that uh, the district is working to advance. And of course, then there's enforcement, uh, which apparently there's not enough of in the neighborhood when it comes to people parking too long. So um, I think that it's, it's going to be an extensive effort. I do also think that the, the, uh, the long-term solution for this is more about traffic demand management and finding uh, different ways to get people there uh, and thinking creatively about it. So I think all the things that, I mean, there are lots of things that were included in the report uh, and what will ultimately come out of this may, may involve even more than that. And some of those things that are on the list may not pan out. Uh, but I think that uh, it's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, ultimately the solution doesn't uh, involve simply building more parking spaces. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just had a couple of, of uh, observations. So it struck me as kind of interesting that we're asking for 166 space increase in parking in the note the EDR notes that currently the number of spaces just for employees and the volunteers happens to be exactly 166. So if we could just solve that problem, <laughs> you've got the extra spaces. And I'll further note that when uh, you're looking, I think there were some good points made about the average car that comes in has 2.7 people in it. The cars that have one person in it are the employees and the volunteers, I would say, for the most part. So uh, you kind of it's, it's kind of a double whammy there where you're you're having the, the people that could be using transit are getting to park there for free and they're taking up the spaces that we happen to need for these families that we want to come. Um, so I just kind of want to make that point that I think that that the one way that the Smithsonian's not let, not unlike any other federal facility is that the employees should have to, or they should be encouraged to use the metro that's a half mile away or bike share or, or circulator service. So um, they don't have so this, the same challenges the families do. Um, I also wanted to ask a technical question. So in the, the conceptual massing photos, it showed a, a potential connection from the new garage into the park. And in looking at a map of the park, I mean, that puts it into the back of some building there. But I couldn't tell. I tried to look at the map. It looks like the crosswalk in the lower right of that screen. That is there. Is there an access point to the zoo right now, right there? Yeah, there is a there is a crosswalk right now, kind of on the kind of right side. Um, it does have a couple steps that go up to like a boardwalk that goes up into the zoo. I think one of the, as far as we understand, I think ADA is one of the the concerns getting through there. I think as well as some cross traffic and some turning that happens coming out of the parking lot as well. But just making sure, because there, because I think in an earlier slide you showed there were two main access points. One off of Connecticut, and then there's another one. But so, so long as there's an access point here, I think it makes sense for the garage because if there isn't an access point that's really, I mean, robust enough to handle the traffic, you just end up people walking all the way around the zoo to one of the main two entrances, and the whole kind of uh, argument over it's too long to walk from the metro becomes kind of moot because you're walking around back to to the front side of it, which is almost as long a walk. Um, so I think that, that that's going to be something important to make sure that there can be a connection there. Otherwise, it's it's you're not going to be able to kind of throughput those people in. Um, and I also wanted to just put on the record that I think the DDOT, uh, they had a, a really good comment in here about the uh, circular turnaround. And I, there's not a lot of talk in the EDR necessarily in the plans about that. It's not necessarily linked to this. But I think that's a really important point because... Um, like, I didn't even know, I've lived here for, for 17 years, I didn't know that there was a shuttle that even went to one of the metros to the zoo, so I don't know if that's about branding or something, but Circulator has some some really good, uh, right, do, they do have a shuttle right now, correct, from one of the stops? So, I mean, it's our understanding that that's something they'd like to okay, explore. So okay. um, it's something that currently the shuttle just serves kind of the immediate zoo area, okay. and they're considering something up to Cleveland Park. Um, as far as the DC circulator, that is something that they've reached out to, to DDOT about, and it's about it's a matter of just kind of whether the 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 bus itself has turned around in the zoo, and I think that's what they're working on now. Okay, and then I just want to also echo what Mr. Shaw said about I know that there's been some support from other council members, the the local ward members, um, and I think that that it would do some good to get a lot more stuff off, the, a lot more uh, non-resident parking off the street, um, and I think this could do that if you integrate it correctly with a, a good traffic management plan. So um, I, th I know that the, uh, a lot of the neighbors are supportive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, I just want to uh, highlight that this is a regional destination. This is not just people living in the city who are coming here using public transit. And 
as a father who has dealt with the stress of arriving to or committing to go to the zoo <laughs> with kids uh, to get them all excited and then get there and not be able to park is a very stressful situation. And so um, I'm, I'm normally uh, very much for TDM and all of that, but uh, I also want to represent that in the region we have to consider that reality. It just is a reality. I did some quick math. If we add a million people and they average 2.7 people per visit, that's about a thousand visits. And if 53% of them uh, come every day, 53% uh, use vehicles, that's still about 500 more vehicles in this million. If you just divided it evenly over a million over 365 days a year. So we're adding 166 with uh, the anticipated growth of 500 after the 53 percent assumed uh, uh, only you know only assumed those for vehicles this is still going to be a tough uh, uh, kind of resolution to the bigger set of problems so I, I agree with the other comments that were made I just want to just add that um, I want to compliment the zoo for the reduced imperviousness that this plan shows, that we're consolidating the footprints in one place, which uh, I think is a really important part of our stormwater management strategies that you've talked about, best management practices and so forth. And uh, I just want to say, make it look good. I mean, we, we really, I think all of us in the region uh, have great pride for our zoo, and uh, we want we think it looks great right now, and we don't want a big, ugly parking lot. It's got to look good. Thank you. Further comments or discussion on this item? Hearing none, the EDR is before you. This is for approved, co approved comments on concepts so they can better inform the RFP process. It's been moved and... Seconded. All in favor of the EDR say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Great. And sticking with parking, um, agenda item 5D is the National Capital Region Federal Parking Study. Uh, we heard an update on this study in July, and the final document is before you. <laughs> And at the end of the presentation, we will actually vote to accept this document and then further instruct uh, staff to keep digging and working on it. So, um, Mr. Wheel, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Staff from the Volpe National Transportation Systems Center were here in July to provide you with an informational presentation on the National Capital Region Federal Parking Study which pertains primarily to federal employees. The study was initiated in September 2016, and our presentation this past July provided some initial modeling analysis observations, which are listed here on this slide again as a reminder. Since then, we have been very busy finalizing our work, and David DiDio and Stephen Zitso Childs are now back to present the study's findings, conclusions, and recommendations, which they will go over in their portion of the presentation. Before I introduce David, however, I would like to present some key points from the study which are listed on the slide before you. The first point is that NCPC system of parking ratios has served the Commission well in supporting our sustainability goals, although as you will see in later slides that it may be beneficial to adjust the policy to better reflect future forecasted regional development. The second point is that NCPC has sometimes adjusted ratios for federal campuses in an attempt to increase their achievability on a case-by-case -case basis when they were deemed too aspirational for their accessibility. In the future, there may be an opportunity to develop a more standard, fair, and equitable process to modify parking ratio goals. And the third point is that to better support federal campuses throughout the region, more frequent, abbreviated travel demand monitoring check-ins with NCPC may be beneficial toward future goal attainment. So with that, I will now turn the presentation over to David DiDio, who is the technical manager for the study. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction and summary. Uh, just to refresh your memory on the study components, there's, there's three parts of the study. 
um, that build on, on each preceding part. The first is the literature review, which was basically an examination of the transportation literature and, and, and thought on transportation and parking policy. Um, the second was a sort of deep dive into local policy related to parking, and I'll, I'll go over the um, findings of these sections in a second. And then the third was a modeling analysis where we reviewed uh, the regional uh, transportation model to try to understand and compare it against uh, NCPC's parking policies. Taking together these three components um, collectively contributed to the recommendations that Mike summarized and that we'll go into in more detail um, in a few minutes. So the first uh, component, the literature review, uh, really the key finding from this was um, that the transportation world over the past 10 or 15 years has moved from uh, what I'd call a mobility paradigm to an accessibility paradigm. You might ask, well, what does that mean? Uh, it's moving from uh, focusing on um, moving cars to getting people um, from origins to destinations. And that might seem um, sort of obvious, but it's a, it's a really profound, profound shift in policy and planning um, and technical tools that support decision making. Um, and so that you'll see that sort of echoed throughout uh, this presentation and, and the report. Uh, so the second component, the local parking comparison, what we found is m many of the local jurisdictions are using um, parking policy in a similar way to NCPC, where they're limiting uh, or eliminating parking and managing parking in a way to um, encourage transit use and more efficient land use uh, patterns. Um, <coughs> and there's the, the region is full of great examples of using parking policy to drive uh, regional development change. So with that, um, I'll switch it to Stephen, and he'll talk about the modeling analysis. So for modeling analysis, we turn to uh, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's regional planning model uh, and took data out of that, accessibility data out of that, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the model that they maintain uh, encompasses the entire NCPC-defined national capital region. Uh, from NCPC, we took 20 uh, case study agency uh, facilities and uh, took information from their transportation management plans. Uh, and then combine those, those data into a model. So accessibility, as David said, uh, we're focusing on moving people instead of moving vehicles. Uh, so the ability of people to reach their destinations. Uh, in particular, for this study, we're focused on uh, commuting time travel for full-time employees to federal facilities. Um, and so we're, in particular, defining accessibility for this study as the number of households, the number of people that can reach a federal facility within a given time period during peak, uh, morning commute time. So the map on the right is showing this mountain of transit accessibility in the core of the region where there's lots of buses and the metro rail uh, providing lots of access. That tapers off across the various metro rail lines out into uh, the suburban region and then down from there where there's uh, very, pretty much auto-dependent areas uh, of the region with little or no transit accessibility. The MW COG model incorporates a lot of changes uh, over time, which we also wanted to keep in mind and be aware of. So changes from now to 2030 and beyond in terms of housing, which is on the left, and also changes to the transportation network, uh, which cause changes in terms of accessibility uh, on the right. So all of the components of the study suggested three main uh, findings, uh, that NCPC's parking policies and processes could be improved with more data-driven policies, a standardized modification process, and performance-based monitoring. All three of these we're going to go into in more detail. So starting with data-driven policies, uh, ratios should better align with regional accessibility both now and into the future. Uh, in particular, the current one to four historic DC boundary zone, that's one parking place per every four employees, uh, facilities in that area are generally offering about twice as much parking as that policy would suggest. Um, into the future, we want to have policies that are both aspirational but also achievable. So that would suggest that this one to four zone maybe should be broken into different components so that facilities could have a more targeted goal. So the map here is showing 
this relative accessibility. It's the trade-off that people are facing between using a form of transit or driving themselves to the, the facility. Um, the historic DC boundary in particular is encompassing a very wide range from the dark blue with lots of transit options to the yellow with very little uh, transit. So again, we want to align, align ratios with regional accessibility. Those particular facilities in Historic DC are tending to fall short. Uh, and we have them here shown in this chart. So uh, taking, for example, the Naval Research Laboratory, the current parking ratio that they are able to achieve here, shown as the gray diamond, it's just under two. Their goal is a one to four. Some facilities do have a modified sort of intermediate target uh, that's shown as a gray bar. So the DC area is covering a very wide variety of, of conditions. Some are, are only able to achieve about a one to two, providing twice as much parking as, as would be suggested by the, the goal. Some are doing better than that. So based on our modeling effort, Volpe proposes to expand a one to five zone, that's the core of the region, taking up L'Enfant City. Uh, a one to four zone that includes the transit rich corridors within historic DC. The remainder of the historic DC boundary would be grouped with the suburban metro rail stations, which would be a one to three zone, and the current one to 1.5 to two suburban area zone would be unchanged. This would be the effect of that on those federal facilities that were the case studies. Uh, so again, this is a much more data-driven approach. Um, the policy area, the policy goals are, tend to be more in alignment with their facilities, still aspirational, but much more achievable. Um, and because this is based on the MWCOG model, it, as that model is updated, these uh, goal areas could be updated to reflect changes to the region. Thanks, Stephen. So, so basically what Stephen just went through is how do we take our policies, which have been in place for many years, and, and more closely align them with no, our more modern understanding of accessibility and transportation conditions across the region? And that's really kind of step one towards having a defensible and data-driven policy. Um, step two is, is sort of acknowledging that we can't account for all the um, unique situations that facilities face across uh, the region. And so therefore, we need a transparent and data-driven uh, process to modify those ratios in the event um, that facilities are, are still not comfortable with the ratios that, that they're um, faced with. And so um, we felt it was important to have a process like this that is transparent um, and data driven, but also are optimistic that with the revised policy areas that the frequency of these requests would be, would be reduced because, um, as Stephen indicated, the policies are going to be more in li alignment with what we think these facilities should be able to achieve. Um, so that's a standardized modification process. Um, and really, the, the, the sort of data package that we're suggesting that NCPC staff request of um, applicants has three components. The first um, is a mission analysis that takes into account uh, the unique nature of each facility, and so giving facilities sort of a, qu a qualitative chance to uh, put forward you know, aspects of the facility's operations that might make it um, need to vary from the policies. The second is an accessibility analysis, which takes into account the, the potential for an employee shuttle to nearby metro rail stations. Um, and so really just trying to get into a more nitty gritty um, understanding of access to facilities on the ground. So again, going from that sort of wide policy map to the specific situation of the facility. Um, and the third is to really take into account um, the actual cost of the taxpayer, the life cycle cost of building a, a facility. Um, so some facilities that are building structured parking, um, of course, those are much more expensive than surface level parking, and so it's important to take into account um, kind of costs in the, in the sort of overall um, criteria based modification process. Um, so the third and perhaps most important part of our recommendation is that we really suggest that um, NCPC staff be in more frequent communication with facilities on their achievement of uh, these different policy goals, these parking ratio policies. Currently, with the master planning process and, and sort of project proposals, um, the frequency of interaction might be four or five or more years with each of these facilities. 
Um, and traditionally, as we learned from the local parking comparison, that level of communication should really be more at an annual or biannual basis. Um, and so we're suggesting um, not a tremendous data collection effort, but at least um, NCPC staff collecting a few key data points from facilities annually or biannually. And, and that would, I mean, basically at a ground level be how many employees are located at your site um, and how many parking spaces are, are you providing. Something that both things that don't change very often should not be a huge burden uh, to facilities and I think will help NCPC staff understand um, more closely uh, how facilities are achieving these different policy goals. So just to kind of step back for a second and remind you, basing the policy framework, making it data-driven, um, having a transparent review process, uh, modification process if facilities need to uh, vary from those more data-driven policies, and then third, a more continual follow-up um, and communication process uh, between NCPC staff and facilities. So again, we want to leave you with these key points from the study, that it may be beneficial to improve the current parking ratio system so that it better fits forecasted accessibility in the region. There may be an opportunity to develop a more predictable, fair and equitable process to modify parking ratio goals. And that more frequent travel demand management coordination with the commission may be a way to help federal campuses attain their travel related goals. You will see in the next and final slide, which is the executive director's recommendation, that we are proposing a series of tasks that will help enable a more data-driven, standardized, performance-based review process. So here is the, exe the executive director's recommendation, which is to accept the study and to direct NCPC staff to evaluate the study recommendations through a series of tasks. And this is pursuant to the commission policies that were adopted in 2008 for formal NCPC review of planning documents. These bulleted tasks are proposed over the next fiscal year as part of an initiative to re-examine some of our transportation and parking related policies based on the recommendations from the study. And we, we will be back in front of the commission to propose amendments to some of our policies after further evaluation by NCPC staff. The tasks include better linking accessibility data to our parking ratio policy, developing a standard process for requesting parking ratio variances, implementing more frequent travel demand management monitoring of federal campuses between master plan updates, and developing additional guidance uh, to federal agencies regarding visitors and other non-employee travel. So with that, that concludes our presentation and we are now uh, available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weil. Uh, Mr. Gallus. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, a comment is, I think the, it seems very rational. I, I applaud your work and thank you for it and it's well presented. Uh, the question really is for NCPC and the staff in terms of what additional operational um, burden will this monitoring proposal put upon you? We just reviewed the, the I'm on the audit committee here and so we're always looking at the the stress is on the budget of the commission. And uh, just curious, have, has that been evaluated at all? Uh, no, that will be one of the, the, the key tasks that we'll evaluate over the next year. Uh, we, you know, by no means uh, are thinking that, you know, we're going to be receiving these pretty detailed TMPs like, you know, federal agencies usually submit with master plan updates every year or two. Uh, what we're thinking now is there may be a possibility to have a, an abbreviated uh, kind of check-in set of performance metrics uh, that, that can be transmitted to staff uh, with, without a burden on either the, the applicant agency or uh, NCPC staff. Um, so again, we recognize that uh, budgets are constrained, staff uh, time is constrained nowadays, so uh, you know, the one thing we would uh, assess is, is we would try to develop a process that uh, would not be uh, very burdensome at all. Uh, and if we were not able to do so, I think uh, we would probably not, not propose anything. For the comments, Mr. May. Okay, so I have a few comments. Um, 
So first of all, I think that um, some folks on my staff were taken a little bit by surprise in, in receiving this study in its fully baked form. As a, and I know we had gotten a preview in July, but I think it actually might have been a good step as to have some sort of intermediate review. Um, I, you know, I saw the July presentation and you know didn't have that much to to think about or or say, um, but. I'm not going to throw a wrench in the works at this moment and say that we shouldn't accept it at this point. Um, but I think that just to, to note that uh, it would have been good to, to see more detail, I think, sooner. Um, and I appreciate the report for what it is. Um, it's actually, I found some of the information in it quite shocking. Um, you know, how is it that, that of the, you look at 20 agencies that have campus parking situations and what were there, three or four that actually were adhering to the standards that, that, uh, that we had set for them? I mean, I, I, I'm puzzled as to how that could actually have come about. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, there are really only a couple of them where the, the, uh, they're below the cap. Yeah, I mean, well, this is, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, based on uh, the TMP data yeah. that we have currently on record, uh, this is a reflection of of what is going on with right. these agencies. Now, some of these master plans, we, we tried to collect recent within five years. Right. Uh, so some of these master plans are three, four, five years old. But right. Um, and I, I mean, I certainly understand how some of them came to pass. Um, I mean, at St. Elizabeth's, they built a lot more parking than they would ultimately need. Mm -hmm. The parking was one of the earliest things that was built. And now it probably won't get built out to that full extent, so there probably won't be as many people, so they probably still won't make their ratio, but it's, you know, it's crazy uh, low at this moment how many they actually, I mean, it's one point something, right, um, at St. Elizabeth's as opposed to what it's supposed to be, which is one to four. It's supposed to be a one to four, and I think it, it's been lowered to one to two point five or one to two point seven. So uh, in the in the change of the master plan, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So um, anyway, so that was just one of the really surprising things about it, um, and it and it raises a concern about um, standardized modification process, as you've called it, because it looks like you know there's a whole bunch of candidates for modifying that process because there's some reasons why <coughs> they need to have more parking. Um, and I'm not sure that that's really the right strategy. I mean, I certainly would want to see a modification process that is uh, done in a, in a manner that's consistent from agency to agency and um, site to site. That's certainly a desirable thing, but not uh, at, at the expense of um, just having to build a lot more or maintain a lot more parking. I think that that's uh, the wrong strategy in the long run. Uh, and I think that, you know, it does not take into consideration even some external issues when it has, when we are talking about what to do about parking, such as um, location decisions that, that might have some uh, issues, right? The decision to put DHS at St. Elizabeth's uh, meant that they had to mitigate the number of people and the number of parking spaces by putting in that high ratio. I mean, I remember that whole debate, and that's one of the reasons why the ratio was so high, even though getting to St. Elizabeth's, particularly if you lived in northern Virginia, remote from the metro, it meant like four modes to get to work every day. And it's just crazy, and it's largely driven by the fact that St. Elizabeth's is not the best suited for that particular facility. But I have made my peace with that. I have made, made my peace with that. Um, but I think that that, you know, it's a lesson for the future because we don't, there are sometimes external reasons why we have to, um, why an agency could be or should be compelled to accept a uh, higher parking ratio uh, in the one to four range or the one to five range or what have you. Um, the last, uh, thing that I would throw out there, and I, you know, I've mentioned this before in this context, but one of the th reasons why we are, um, I, I think we are not 
able to achieve the kind of mode splits that we'd like to see is because of the extent to which the federal government subsidizes parking for some of its employees. Because when you get to park for free, that's a subsidy. And it's especially a subsidy in places where they, you know, structured parking has been built at a cost of ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars per space and they are still free. And it's not free for every employee of that agency. There are many people you know, many people working for the same agency in rented space and they don't get free parking. So why is it appropriate that some people get it and some people don't? I don't know, but I think that this is I you know, it's the elephant in the room. And I think that at some point this agency, NCPC, probably should look at that question. Maybe this isn't the right place to do it. And again, this isn't the first time I've mentioned this issue, but I think it's something that we should be facing. Thank you. Other comments? So the question before us is accepting the EDR, um, uh, accepting the report and directing staff to continue its deep dive on it for possible amendments to the comprehensive plan. Is there a motion? It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It's accepted. Thank you, Mr. Weil, very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bolby, for your very good work. <laughs> the last item on the agenda is an information presentation on the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative, which last time this was before us, generally, I guess, it was in relation to the FBI building, uh, but uh, that project notwithstanding, um, the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative um, here at NCPC churns on. <laughs> Where is your FBI building, by the way? Where? Yeah. What is the status Still there. of it? <laughs> you haven't resolved that thing yet. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> Ms. Ridgely, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I am here today to update the Commission on the extensive work undertaken by the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative's Executive Committee. I'll provide a brief refresher today on the project, review the key findings from our market study and urban design analysis, uh, a bit on the upcoming transportation study, and discuss how these findings will frame the initiative's forthcoming action plan to improve the avenue. Now, executive summaries of the market and urban design work were included in your briefing packets, um, but I also wanted to let folks know that the reports in full will be available online on NCPC's initiative page. Uh, Mr. Sox did mention that uh, NCPC is under, uh, undergoing an update to the website, so hopefully tomorrow those will be up and ready to go. Um, now, the, the research was conducted to better understand the many challenges and opportunities that we can build on to make the avenue an even better destination in our capital city. Now, as the chairman mentioned, some of the analysis builds upon the work of the FBI square guidelines, uh, which were improved by the commission here in January. And that was really a, a focused effort to develop a new building envelope, the build to line and other design guidance for squares 378 and 379. And now the initiative is taking those results of that work and looking at it um, in the context of the entire avenue. So let's briefly roll through some background information. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, the study area shown here in yellow, it covers about 1.2 miles of the avenue, and that's lo located between the White House and the U.S. Capitol. It does include the area covered by the 1974 Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation Plan, shown here in blue, as well as the Federal Triangle area just to the south. Now, a quick refresher on the PADC. It was established in 1972 by Congress to redevelop the avenue, and it served as a catalyst for Washington's downtown development revival through the 90s. And after redevelopment was mostly complete, the PADC was sunset in 96 by Congress, and the ongoing responsibilities were handed to the General Services Administration, the National Park Service, and NCPC, and the district re retained jurisdiction over the roadway. And though PADC no longer exists, its plan and related documents are still in effect today. So why explore the avenue improvements now? As I just mentioned, the avenue is governed by a congressionally approved plan that was written back in 74. And PDC was very successful, but it hasn't existed for over two decades now. 
Um, and the plan that's still in effect today does not reflect today's conditions and urban planning practices. So this is really a fundamentally different place than it was back in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Uh, there was no Uber, no 9-11, uh, no major stormwater management regulations. All of this really came to be after the plan was developed. And our workplaces are fundamentally different. We telework, we hotel, um, retail has changed. And all these new urban conditions and planning practices that can be, can be seen today in, in new development throughout the city. And some of it is happening on the avenue. Uh, but even more of it is occurring in other neighborhoods like city center and uh, the Capitol Riverfront. And these places are providing some significant economic competition for the avenue. And in addition to the planning and development changes, there are also, uh, also are significantly different operations and maintenance practices today. So given all these changes, now really is the time to take this holistic look um, and ensure the avenue remains one of the most important places in our capital city. The initiative's executive committee was formed to chart a path forward to this more successful avenue. And it includes uh, the agencies that were handed these post-PADC responsibilities, uh, as well as DDOT and the Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development. We are also working very closely with the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts and D.C. Office of Planning on this effort. And all these agencies were also involved in those FBI Square Guidelines discussions. Uh, and those were incredibly helpful to set up the initiative's work, exploring these potential changes to the avenue. So let's walk through some of the key findings from our analysis work. Uh, this is for the market study and urban design analysis. And we'll also have a few initial findings from the transportation study, which will be completed over the winter. We first worked on the market study with our consultants at HRNA Advisors. Uh, the goal was to gain a better understanding of the avenue's economic strength within five market sectors. Overall, the trends point to stability along the avenue, with the greatest opportunity for growth in the cultural and retail sectors. It does remain a strong location within the city for culture and entertainment, uh, uses and activities. It serves as a character-defining feature of the avenue. And tourism numbers continue to increase annually, and we want to take advantage of that. Uh, at 26, a Was Washington did top 22 million visitors, which was a 3% increase over 2015. The hotel sector is thriving on the avenue, both for tourism and business trips, and the area has some of the highest occupancy and daily rates in the city. Office, of course, remains the most common land use. Vacancy rates have fluctuated as some of the larger law offices have moved to other neighborhoods, uh, but the avenue still has some of the highest asking rents in the city. And the federal government remains the largest employer. Uh, they have over 10 million square feet of owned and leased office space in the area. The study did note uh, that the avenue's office buildings have larger footprints, while the trend in the broader office market is for smaller ones. Retail has the opportunity to grow within well-positioned locations, but the demand is hampered in part by the cafeterias and other food and convenience services that are provided within office buildings. The market study found a potential demand for up to 400,000 additional square feet of retail, which is a big number. Uh, last but not least, residential remains a small but stable land use in the area. Uh, unfortunately, though, due to the low population housed in about 1,400 residential units, it's just not big enough to attract neighborhoods serving retail like grocery stores to the area. So here are a few of the advantages of the avenue. It's centrally located, easily accessible. The concentration of cultural and historic destinations attract a really high number of visitors. Government is a stable economic source for the avenue, and it's the key driver of economic activity. There still remains a preference for downtown living, and that continues to drive residential demand in the area. And while there are limited redevelopment opportunities downtown, the recent consideration of FBI could be transformative if and when the opportunity emerges. Uh, of course, there are also some market challenges that the initiative has to tackle. Of course, real estate is expensive down here, uh, and there is limited opportunity to build new space out. And while the avenue does have a strong civic identity, it does not serve as a regular destination for locals in the same way that places like 14th Street or Georgetown do. And the design of the federal buildings and many of the private office buildings, too, negatively impact that ground floor economic activity. So these were the overall findings and um, for the market study. On to the urban design analysis. We, we did begin this with our consultant, Sasaki Associates, uh, around the time that we wrapped up the market study. But the FBI Square Guidelines took a higher priority. And that work included, like I mentioned earlier, build two lines, heights, uh, other urban form and land, land use components for that site. So after the work was completed in January, we were able to take a lot of that analysis and apply it to the avenue. 
Now the heart of the report is um, contained here um, within these three sections. Let's see, Ooh, sorry about that. There we go. Um, the first one is land use and activity. Um, and we were really looking at ways to um, explore building and ground floor uses, uh, the hours of operation for, for buildings within the study area. And we also looked at public space, both from a civic activity standpoint, um, as well as a daily use. Uh, for mobility and access, we of course wanted to look at the network. Um, to better understand how all modes of transportation were functioning in the area. Um, one of our big findings there was that we have two vehicular lanes or about 20 feet of roadway that could be used for something else. It could be bikes, pedestrians, or transit without impacting the traffic. Um, for the third piece, we looked at urban form, place making an infrastructure. We wanted to understand what the physical and design components that make this space unique are. Um, and of course, we found that the public space configuration is a significant feature that unifies the avenue, and it frames one of the most important vistas in our city. Uh, we also inclu included two supporting sections you see here on the right. Uh, the Capital City case studies provide an overview of other notable streets that balance commercial, civic, and neighborhood needs. And then for the character areas, we took a closer look at the block by block scale to explore the character defining features. And you know, of course we accept that the avenue streetscape does serve as a unifying feature. We wanted to understand the smaller physical and programmatic details of the avenue that make them different from each other. So out of this analysis, we synthesized four key findings. Two of them deal with the overall strengths and two cover the overall challenges. So let's cover the strengths first. Uh, this diagram synthesizes the avenue and its strengths. I'll walk through this um, and highlight a, key, a few key points here. Uh, first is the avenue has a strong civic identity and character. Uh, this is due in part to its grandeur and vista, the architecture and landscape architecture that expresses the strength and endurance of our nation. Um, and a lot of this is reinforced through a strong distribution of parks and plazas along the avenue, um, with the streetscape creating that green spine that connects these spaces together. The identity and character can also be seen in the office uses that make it an important federal workplace and the cultural and entertainment uses and activities that draw both visitors and residents to the avenue. This is re reinforced through two strong mixed use nodes at Market Square in the Willard Hotel, as well as a mix of cultural and entertainment uses in the area shown up here in purple. The other strength is that the avenue is well served by multiple modes of transportation and it provides good city and regional access. Um, we have easy access to multiple modes of transit, highway, um, tourism access through tour buses, uh, all that's readily available. Uh, from a bike standpoint, of course, we have the bike lane right down the middle, but also half of the streets crossing the avenue north-south are also safely accessible by bike. Uh, and that north-south connectivity between downtown and the National Mall is strong at certain places like 7th Street, which serves as a hub of activity along with Market Square. So next, uh, we have a couple challenges as well. First, the avenue does not provide that consistently engaging experience for daily users. And this has come up in a number of the executive committee's conversations. Uh, it really does lack the pedestrian scale, interest, and comfort that one would want uh, for a destination street. And many of the parks and plazas, while there are a number of them, they have weak design programs with little programming and um, at times maintenance is a challenge as well. And the predominance of the federal offices and cultural uses, while it's great to draw people in during the day, it really does hinder the ability to generate activity in the evenings and on the weekends. Uh, and this is most evident through the inactive frontages that you can see in this diagram in gray, which is a significant amount. The other challenge is that the avenue suffers from a lack of connectivity to the surrounding areas. So I mentioned 7th Street earlier, and it has that strong north-south connection. Um, well, many of the other streets don't have that. If you walk down 9th or 12th, you certainly don't get that same experience. Block-long single-use buildings filled with office space discourages pedestrians from walking along the avenue and exploring those areas to the north and south. It's almost like a barrier. And that east-west connectivity, speaking of barriers, is, is an issue too. Um, the street closures at the White House, uh, as well as the US Capitol, have eliminated the avenue's function as a thoroughfare. So as I mentioned earlier, we did build off the FBI square guidelines analysis. Um, the, that outcome really does allow additional changes and potential reallocation or reduction of that cartway and sidewalks if certain performance criteria related to the function and character of the public space can be achieved. 
Now, while the guidelines focused on the FBI site itself, um, the discussions acknowledged the need for adequate public space and to understand how those potential changes would impact the entire avenue. So to begin exploring this potential change, DDOT is conducting an internal transportation study to start to optimize mobility needs along the corridor. Now, while work is still underway on this, I would like to share a few initial findings, um, and the full results will be ready next year and used to inform the, the executive committee's potential changes to the carway and sidewalks. So first, um, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, the lack of east-west connectivity on the avenue has significantly reduced traffic. And the result is that motorists instead use the avenue for a short distance to access these major north-south routes. So you see a lot of turning motions um, across the avenue. And this reinforces the earlier finding that uh, I mentioned about putting the avenue on a two-lane road diet um, while still accommodating transportation needs. Next, Pennsylvania Avenue is one of the busiest transit corridors in Washington. Um, they have sometimes 80 buses an hour uh, during peak periods, and that, that includes regional commuter buses, tour buses, metro bus, delivery vehicles, passenger pickups and drop-offs. All of the, they are all looking for curbside space, um, which is another um, amenity that's much needed on the avenue. Next up, the center running separated bike lane on the avenue does serve as the backbone of the study area. It carries up to 2,000 bike trips a day. Uh, and its unique location is a little tricky though, as you can see in this image, um, due to signal timing and the width of the avenue, sometimes pedestrians have to share that median space in the middle with cyclists, and that often results in conflicts. So we'll have more information on this um, early next year, and again, this information will be helped to determine, or be used to help determine next steps. Speaking of which, uh, this brings us to the action plan. And the executive committee met in July uh, at a workshop to review all of these key findings I just mentioned and use them as a foundation to begin framing an action plan. So out of these findings, they developed four goals and approaches to near and long-term actions that will be further developed in the coming months. The first goal is to celebrate the Avenue's civic role and democratic experience. It's something the Avenue is doing well and we want to elevate it. This involves building upon the avenue's role as a stage for American events and creating and enhancing opportunities for everyone to participate in the capital city's civic life. Next is to develop the avenue's vital urban landscape in and around this awe-inspiring architecture. We really want to harmonize the landscape and the buildings to accentuate the capital vista and elevate the civic quality of the avenue. We want to improve the pedestrian experience through more active, accessible public spaces and ground floor uses that really draw people into the avenue every day of the week. The third goal is to reinvigorate the avenue's circulation and mobility needs. This involves making more walkable uh, spaces for the avenue and allowing it to work more efficiently for all transportation options. And it also in involves improving those connections to the surrounding neighborhoods. The fourth goal is to elevate the identity of the avenue as a great destination. This will create an inviting and beautiful setting for everyday activities and provide those flexible spaces that contribute to the energy of the avenue. So how does the initiative plan to accomplish all this? Well, near term, the focus will be on programmatic changes to tell the clear, captivating story of our city and nation, bring daily activity and interest back to the avenue, and to strengthen the avenue's identity and character. Long term, the initiative will pursue a redesign of the avenue to reinforce its civic significance, strengthen its daily use and experience, and ensure the long term operational success of this very special place. So given all these findings and goals, um, we are headed forward. And the executive committee has learned a lot from the research and analysis phase of this work. Uh, and all these key findings from the research will help to inform this next phase of the work over this fall and winter. Um, the executive committee will develop an issues and opportunities summary to summarize these key findings, establish the initiative goals, um, and share an action plan to guide these near and long-term actions. We anticipate returning to the commission probably towards the middle of next year for this summary. And after that, there's more long-term collaborative work ahead to enact the improvements included in the action plan. Now, some of it's already underway through projects like the Avenue Planters. I'm not sure if you all have seen them. Uh, General Services Administration has worked really hard with the um, National Park Service and BID um, to, to really beautify the avenue. Um, and there's, of course, more work to be done beyond that. As I mentioned, the square guidelines determine that the initiative would study reallocating uses within the cartway and sidewalk areas 
And we recognize that these potential changes would require careful consideration and compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, as well as the National Historic Preservation Act. Now, this would require an amendment to the 1974 plan as well, um, probably likely a new streetscape design, and of course, funding commitments for the entire avenue. So if this is pursued, uh, public outreach will, of course, be an important part of that phase. Uh, and we do look forward to exploring these potential changes through the NEPA and 106 processes. So again, the full reports will be available for download on the project website tomorrow. Um, you can also sign up for project updates there and ask questions about the initiative as well. So I do look forward to returning uh, with more details on the action plan and work towards a more active and engaging avenue. So at this point, this completes my presentation uh, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ridgely. Uh, increasing uh, or enhancing its civic uh, significance and boosting its daily use are two very key goals. Uh, Mr. Cash. So I just, from the local government perspective, I just would be kind of remiss if I didn't mention it. I always kind of, I hear very clearly when we say this is like a civic avenue, we want to increase this, increase the civic uses, we want to activate it. But I think that we, we have to remember that we're very unique with the avenue and that this is probably the one civic space in a major United States city that's not actually under the control of the local government that is trying to actually reach out to people that, that stay here and live here in the district and maybe have an evening event or a little pop-up something in, in the big space in front of the FBI and you actually have to go to the Park Service to even get a permit to do any of that. So I just think that that all this, the, the action plan will be great. I think anything we can do to get it um, a lot more activated and make it a better part of the city will be great. But I think that's one of the important things to remember that there it's one of the big challenges with this space too because trying to get, get the uses increased when it's not just the middle of a work day like this, it's we don't have a lot of control over that locally. So so any kind of interaction you can do with the city or looking at new governance structures, um, recommendations in those areas would be great. Absolutely, it's a big obstacle and it, it really hits upon goal number four. Um, again, this is a place that we want residents to come to and enjoy. It's a space for everybody. You don't have to just be a, you know, a tourist from out of town to come to the avenue, so. I have a sidewalk, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll take the sidewalk in front of the, the city hall. <laughs> Other comments or questions for Ms. Ridgely? Um, yeah, so um, we've been working with the staff through all of these, uh, all, all this, pro when did it actually get started? 2014. 2014, okay. So it's been a while, um, and I'm glad to clear this. I mean, I think this is actually, a, it's not, really pronounced in here, but this is a pretty significant milestone to reach this point. And I'm really hoping that we will get uh, through this quickly and start moving into real planning because it, it is going to take some real planning to um, beautify the avenue and to uh, get through the governance changes and uh, to see the improvements that we all think uh, would make the avenue uh, really great year round. So. Uh, I look forward to pushing forward now. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, before we depart, I think uh, Ms. White had a question. I just had a quick question about the, the written executive director's report we got in our packages, and it mentions the D.C. Smart City Summit and the Global City Team Challenge. So I'm just wondering, going forward, if we could hear more about what happened at these um, gatherings because it sounds pretty interesting especially the transportation of the future from the DC smart city summit where leaders from across the globe came to talk about the future of these issues so maybe down the road if we could get presentations about things you might have learned at these sound pretty interesting that we've been monitoring and participating in um, and we will eventually provide some um, background information to the commission on our support and uh, involvement on, on that. But most recently, a sub-initiative has been the district's uh, smart city initiative to put in uh, technology along Pennsylvania Avenue. That's, that's part of a global uh, city, smart city initiative. So we will um, report out on some of the activities we've been involved in. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hearing nothing else, thank you very much. We've had a most productive meeting, and we are adjourned. <laughs>